and welcome to those of you who are watching live as well as to those of you who are in the atrium um, here to celebrate some new hires, I believe. I'm hesitating a bit because I'm waiting for the agenda to appear on the screen um, for those who are watching live, and I don't see that yet. So there it is. All right. Thank you. This meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Ms. Cloninger? Here. Mr. Lavalley? Here. Mr. Lundberg? Here. Ms. Reynolds? Here. Mr. Temby? Mr. Timmy is absent. Thank you. Um, we will be doing the Pledge of Allegiance as a group tonight, so please join the board for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Matson. are there any updates to the agenda? There were some updates and the board was notified of these updates. Thank you. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move to uh, from the consent agenda? Seeing none, are there any items to be added to the agenda? And seeing none, may we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Ms. Reynolds? Aye. Thank you. There's, I feel like I'm in a tunnel or something, but I guess the mics are loud enough. Um, our board quote this evening is from Ms. Cloninger. Take it away, Ms. Cloninger. I will. <laughs> I just restarted my phone, <laughs> so I don't have it in front of me. Sorry. Hang on one second. There we go. Um, my uh, board quote for tonight was, is from Malcolm X um, stating that education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Um, obviously, when we're preparing for tomorrow, um, that's what we do when we're educating our kids. And I believe there is other aspects to preparing for the future, and that is to accept, to accept change. This country continues to evolve, and we need to prepare our students for what their futures look like, not the futures we had. And I think that um, Malcolm X was uh, an, an interesting character for that. Um, and like him, uh, there's a lot of evolution that happened in his life um, and, and in our own educations from when we were young to what our children are looking at, they're certainly facing different things. And I recognize that there's a lot of um, opinion about what change looks like and, and how change is received. I just hope that we're open to it and open to um, calm um, conversations. Indeed, I like calm, Mrs. Conninger. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to agenda item 6A. Mrs. Cortez, do we have anyone signed up to speak to the board this evening? This evening, we do not have any public speakers. Thank you, Mrs. Cortez. Got down here quick. I'm going to move on to agenda item B. It's board comments, and I'll begin this evening with Mr. Lundberg. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here, even on a snowy night. I had to drive my wife's four-wheel drive here. <clears throat> it is great to be here. It's good to hear that there are people in the in the uh, audience too which we haven't had in a long time. Not a lot to go over, but uh, I know that on our work session that Mrs. Reynolds will go over some of the material we covered at the uh, work session before the school board meeting on her comments. So thanks for everyone being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. Mr. LaValle. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. I have a few things. I, I virtually attended the uh, National School Board Association NSBA conference last week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, it, it was a mixed bag. Um, there were some things I got pretty frustrated with, but there were some excellent sessions and I really enjoyed them, um, those 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 uh, sessions. Uh, and I copied these bullet points from a, a session titled How School Boards and Local District Governance Affect Student Success. And number one was, and, and you, we know this, but we kind of forget, boards can negatively affect student learning. 
which is sort of the negative side. But then number two was board, excuse me, school board beliefs and actions can affect student learning in positive ways. And I believe that traditionally District 20 has fallen in that. We have, we as a board and, and our predecessors behaved and, and acted in such a way that we encouraged student learning. And I, and frankly, we're continuing to do that. And I, and I very much value that. And then number three, specific actions of boards correlate with improving student achievement. So I just thought those were really good and just little reminders. Um, I just, a couple other things, um, and I, I should have known this, I, I suspect uh, a while ago, but I didn't. Masks are not required for children in schools 10, age 10 and under. Um, I look forward to our district um, with our principals getting together and removing that mask mandate for elementary just as soon as we possibly can. Um, and also masks are not required outdoors currently in our district. So, um, uh, and again, that's one of those if if parents want their kids to wear a mask, if we now if when we get to that point, that's great. Um, and, and just a final note, uh, I thought I would make this official. I do intend on running for reelection in November for this sports seat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavelli. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mrs. Cloninger. <laughs> Thank you. I also attended the NASB virtual session and um, just wanted to say I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think um, maybe possibly because I have never been to it in person. I paid attention to all of the um, speakers. We had incredible keynote speakers and some of our breakout sessions were um, amazing. I commented in my little clip that we um, write uh, turn in for our for our um, board presence, whatever um, our questionnaire about the whole thing. Um, uh, that I especially liked a young boy. Um, I think he was in Texas singing with a mariachi band. <laughs> it's so impressive, and there was just a lot of really good um, singing. And I know that some of it was um, uh, recorded or previously um, recorded from other years but it made me miss the opportunity to see our kids perform. I get to go um, this next week um, to Rampart and see uh, little women coming from a all family of four girls. I played Joe, even though I was Amy's position, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. So I, I just am grateful that we have that opportunity to learn from our, our um, other board members around the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Conninger. Colonel Johnson. Nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would just like to um, yeah, talk briefly about our work session this this afternoon um, and remind the board that we have another one on May 6th and that board work session will deal with um, reporting for E 1.1. You, you remember that conversation. So that will be a good conversation as well in today's work session. Um, as you can see from our um, agenda was about budget planning and budget planning, including some mill levy override conversations and what is the best timing on that and knowing that um, there's there's a good timing when it comes to putting that in front of our community and um, the, the hope that it's going to be within a couple of years that we'll be able to bring that to our community again. We also talked about when we can begin to use our boardroom the way it was designed and that is to include more people and we're looking forward to that possibility. There's a lot of a lot of hope out there, but still a lot of caution about what we can do going forward. And I think about where we were last year, and I'm trying to be really positive about this. Last year, we were all in our homes and all on our computers, and kids weren't in school at all. So we have that now, and we're going to continue to to be able to open up. I'm I'm convinced. So it's good to good to hear that um, we're moving forward. Um, the NASB conference. Thank you for those of you who went attended. I was unable to attend. Um, but the good news is I was able to give that registration to Mr. LaValle um, who could attend and some of you have already done it, but your travel forms were sent to you and we need to complete those if you haven't and thought we'd sent some time aside during our board development part of our agenda next time for you to talk about your biggest learnings from that. So if you were re ready to share what you learned and some things that really resonated with you, that would be great. You'll see it on the agenda as well, but just so you can prepare and plan ahead. I also wanted to thank Becky Allen for her presentation about ethics and school finance to UCCS students. It was well received. She did an excellent job and students had fun uh, listening to her and sharing and debriefing with me afterwards, so it was great. And Tanya Thompson's up next week. So if you want to join and need a link in, let me know. You can listen to what um, Tanya has to say about 
ethics in school law. Also, um, finally, as I watch the messages come in and the alerts that we get from schools, I have to tell you, I continue to be impressed with the way our schools are trying so hard to have celebrations at the end of the year for kids this year. I like high school, I mean, the high school effort at DCC to have an outdoor prom and to be able to do something very different, and we would call it a prom, but it's very different, but it's very nice for seniors. It's nice to be able to see that this year as well. We couldn't do that last year. And the elementary and middle schools also are doing similar things. So I'm looking forward to graduations and being a part of those things. I got an invitation tonight to one school, so I'm sure that the rest of you will too. It's, it's awesome. And finally, I just want to thank Tina Matson for her work. Um, this is not an easy job to fall into. She's still smiling, um, but she's done a great job. Done a great job. Quick study um, is serving us well. So thank you, Tina, again. Let me appreciate it. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Gregory with administration comments. Yeah, I'd invite Dr. Peek to the podium, please. Good evening, board and Mr. Gregory. I'm pleased this evening to introduce the six individuals for administrative positions that are in your packet. Each candidate meets all state licensing requirements and school district prerequisites. As you know, each candidate has also completed our rigorous process for achieving this recommendation, including paper screening, pre-screening, interviews, preliminary interviews, final interviews, reference checking, Sometimes even site visits happen, lots happens in order for us to select these individuals. So we are delighted that many applicants showed interest in the six positions and I want to thank the teachers, support staff, administrators, parents and students who took part and took time from their other obligations to participate through the various parts of these interview processes. So first, it's a bit bittersweet. <laughs> uh, to be introducing the individual with whom is going to be replacing me. Uh, and hope Cameron is on here in just a moment, but I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Cameron Smart, who is being recommended as the next Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources in Academy District 20. Cameron uh, is pictured here. What a lovely family he has, and I've had the good fortune of visiting with him a couple of times already this week. His wife, Sarah, and he and Sarah actually have two sets of twins. Uh, 11 year old fraternal twins, Jaden and Jillian and then seven-year-old twins, Austin and Logan. And what I understand is Austin is the one in the darker hair and Logan is the one that's a little mischievous and, uh, and, and actually Cameron confirmed that Logan is in fact a little mischievous. So uh, Cameron and his family actually have roots here back in Colorado and uh, his wife, Sarah's parents, in Fort Collins and there's a sister and brother-in-law in Wellington and they also have some family in the Denver area, so I know they're excited about coming back to Colorado. Cameron holds a Bachelor of Science degree in physical education, teaching and coaching from the University of Wyoming and Laramie, a Master of Arts degree in physical education from Northern Arizona University and Flagstaff, and an administrative credential in school administration from Chapman University in Orange County, California. He began his educational career in uh, Chinle Unified School District in Arizona, and then Hesperia Unified School District in California teaching physical education. He eventually became the vice principal in Hesperia Unified School District before, before becoming the high school principal in Silver Valley Unified School District in Yermo, California, where he served as a principal for seven years. In 2015, Cameron served as a senior director of student services in Yermo, California before assuming the role that he's in currently as Director for Human Resources in Apple Valley Unified School District. We're certainly pleased to present Cameron to you tonight, remote from California for the position of Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. And Cameron, I hope you're on the call. And if you are, is there anything you'd like to share with uh, the board and Mr. Gregory and others? Okay, I think I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks Cameron. Awesome. Hey, first of all, appreciate you guys letting me join you via telephone. Uh, and I'm just super excited about this opportunity. I really appreciate everyone that participated in the interview panel. Uh, Mr. Gregory and the school board, uh, my family and myself are excited to get out there as soon as we can and get started and, and join the team. And so I just uh, want to say I'm thankful for this opportunity. 
Thank you so much, Cameron. We're looking forward to your transition and coming to Academy 20. So next, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Manchester, who is being recommended as the Assistant Principal Athletic Director at Liberty High School. Scott, you want to come at least to the doorway here for a moment, and then uh, we're going to have you come up to the podium in just a moment. So uh, Scott, uh, his family's back in Canyon City, his wife Misty, with whom actually I've worked with through Human Resources, uh, and then they have two children, Zoe 18 and Zach 23, and Zach's in Fort Collins. Scott holds a Bachelor of Science degree in History and a Master of Arts degree in Secondary School Counseling from Adams State College. He began his educational career in Canyon City as a middle school social studies teacher and history teacher, then served as their school counselor. He served as an elementary school principal in Canyon City and then served as K-8 school as their counselor. For the past eight years, Scott has served as athletics activities director at Canyon City High School, so he knows what he's getting into. We are certainly pleased tonight to present Scott to you for the position of Assistant Principal Athletic Director at Liberty High School. And Scott, I welcome you to the podium. Well, I just wanted to take a couple moments to thank all of you for the time, dedication, and effort that you do for kids. Uh, thank Mr. Gregory. Uh, thank also, obviously, uh, Liberty High School, uh, Mr. Timig, uh, for the opportunity, as well as all staff that was involved in the whole process. And, and finally, a thank you to my wife of going on 29 years and, and my son and daughter and, and for what they've done and the support that they've had for me. And, and again, very excited about uh, moving ourselves up and relocating here to Cardinal Springs and uh, being part of Academy District 20 and, and uh, being part of Liberty. And so go Lancers. Thank you so much. All right. And next, I'm pleased tonight to introduce Brendan Netherton, who is being recommended as Assistant Principal Athletic Director for Pine Creek High School. Uh, Brendan uh, also has family uh, remote right now, up back up in Denver, wife Katie, uh, Nolan five, and there's Quinn, who's two, and Melody 10. Uh, so, uh, but they have connections uh, in Colorado Springs as well. Brendan holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in education from McPherson College in Kansas, a Master's of Educational Administration from Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, and began his educational career in Harrison District 2 as a physical education teacher and also math reading interventionist, RTI, MTSS coordinator, and then served as dean and athletic director for South Middle School in Aurora. For the past uh, four years, Brendan has served as assistant principal athletic director at Gateway High School in Aurora Public Schools, and we're pleased this evening to introduce yet another experienced athletic uh, director for your consideration for Pine Creek High School, Brendan. I feel like I just uh, witnessed someone speak really well and following a project. Uh, it's always fun, right, as students. But thank you all for uh, having me here. Um, uh, Mr. Gregory, thank you for the, the great talk the other day. and. Um, uh, I don't know if you've been to his office or not. I'm sure all of you have. It's a great office. Um, I also would like to thank the board for what you all do uh, for these uh, young adults in this district um, and then the Pine Creek uh, staff that are out there right now uh, supporting me uh, and Coach Molo even, one of my uh, receiver coaches from Mitchell High School. Go Marauders, right, Mr. Gregory? Um, out there uh, right now supporting me. Go Marauders. Uh, that's right. Go Marauders. And so... Um, yeah, I just want to want to thank them. And then, of course, my wife, uh, she's the superhero of our house. Uh, we have three young young kids and she's uh, being soccer mom right now. Without her, uh, really, none of this is possible. So thank you, Katie. Um, and um, I'm just looking forward to, to going to the next step. And so thank you for having me here. All right. Thank you, Brendan. And now I'm pleased to introduce Megan Sanders, who is being recommended as the assistant principal for Rampart High School. And Megan is joined with her family out in the atrium, husband Jason and their twins, Brooke and Charlie. There's a theme this evening about twins. They're nine, they attend Palmer Lake Elementary School. Megan holds a Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics from the University of California 
in Long Beach, California, a Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. She started her teaching career in Torrance, California as a high school math teacher. Upon moving to Colorado Springs, she taught math at Rampart High School. So she's coming home. Megan then served as an instructional coach at Skyview Middle School in Falcon School District 49. And for the past five years, Megan has served as their assistant principal at Skyview Middle School. We are certainly pleased this evening to present Megan to you tonight for the position of assistant principal for Rampart High School. And Megan, I invite you. Good evening. I want to start by saying thank you to the Academy District 20 Board of Education and Mr. Gregory for having me here tonight. Also, thank you to Pete Alvarez over at Rampart High School. I'm very excited to be coming home. Uh, it feels very, very good to be back here and to be back with the Rams. Uh, and then just thank you to my husband and my kids for always supporting me and empowering me to keep pushing myself. And I'm looking very, very forward to the 21-22 school year. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Leslie Hicks, who is being recommended as assistant principal for Timberview Middle School. I know Leslie's son, Justin, I believe, is in the atrium, and there's a bunch of colleagues and friends and folks cheering on either from atrium or from afar. Leslie holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Geography from the University of Montana, Missoula, a Master of Education in Educational Leadership for Innovation and Change, and her Colorado Principal Licensure Certificate from Regis University. Leslie started her career as a guest teacher in Academy District 20 for one year before being hired at Mountain Ridge Middle School as a sixth grade social studies teacher. During her first 17 years at Mountain Ridge, she taught sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, as well as served on numerous school and district committees as well as coached volleyball and swimming. More recently, Leslie has served for two years as Rampart High School as their MTSS coordinator before returning back to Mountain Ridge where she has served as a MTSS coordinator. Of course, you all know that she most recently is serving as assistant principal at Mountain Ridge Middle School and we're certainly pleased that she is able to support Timberview Middle School moving forward in her new role as assistant principal. Leslie, I'd welcome you up. Good evening. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you so much to the board, to Mr. Gregory. Um, I am so pleased to be able to be going to Timberview Middle School to um, continue um, my career here in Academy School District 20. Um, District 20 has been a, a very important part of all of my whole family's life for uh, many, many years. I have three proud graduates, um, my children from Academy School District 20. Um, I have ab thoroughly enjoyed my time at Mountain Ridge and at Rampart. Um, I want to thank Mr. Stirk and the rest of the Mountain Ridge uh, family for my time at Mountain Ridge, and I am thrilled to be going to Timberview Middle School. I want to thank Brett Smith and the rest of the, the crew at Timberview. I look forward to continuing on their strong legacy of excellence for Academy School District 20. Thank you. And finally, this evening, I'm pleased to introduce Dan Hinken, who is being recommended as assistant principal for Challenger Middle School. Dan, uh, I believe, has some colleagues and friends out in the atrium, and I'm sure cheering on from afar his, uh, his folks. Dan holds a Bachelor of Science degree in science education from the University of uh, Central Florida and a Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Dan started his teaching career at Russell Middle School in uh, uh, District 11 and an eighth grade at social studies, teaching social studies and reading teacher, then served as social studies teacher at Discovery Canyon Campus High School. Dan served in Montego Bay, Jamaica for a year as a humanities teacher for Fairfield International Academy and personally I'm jealous. Upon returning to Colorado Springs, which we're very pleased he did, Dan has served as a humanities teacher at Chinook Trail Middle School with Mr. Andrew. 
We're certainly pleased tonight to present Dan to you for the position of assistant principal for Challenger Middle School. And Dan, is there anything you'd like to share? Good evening, and I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity uh, to continue my career in D20. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gregory, to the board, and to really everybody who has been along this path. Uh, you know, my friends and, and mentors and colleagues out in on the lobby, and Andy and Mark and Tom, and uh, thank you for Debbie for uh, bringing me along on this journey. And I'm just really excited to get to know the community uh, and to continue on my career in D20. Thank you to the board. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Gregory and the board for these six fabulous uh, newly recommended and hired, soon to be hired, hopefully in a few moments, ad administrators. I would kindly just share with you, Mr. Gregory and the board, that it might be a little bit of a wild rumpus on the other side of these walls in the atrium for a few minutes to let them celebrate after consent agenda. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Peak, and, and they do deserve to celebrate, and I'm really happy for those, those six folks. Um, as you can hear the applause happening now. Uh, I do have a few uh, announcements. Um, three Liberty High School staff are being recognized, and in fact were recognized yesterday because I was there while they were being recognized. Uh, but three staff at Liberty are being recognized by the Colorado Springs Army Recruiting Command for their essential work during the pandemic. Curtis Riley, Liberty Technology Technician, and Brianna and Kelly Straub, husband and wife combination uh, teachers at both at Liberty, were praised for going above and beyond to keep students connected, inspired, and excited about learning throughout this past year. Congratulations to all three of them. And Mr. Timig, uh, uh, we used the gym, he used the gymnasium for this uh, celebration, and he noted that that was the first time since last year that the entire staff had been in one place at the same time in a you know big gigantic circle around the outside of of the gymnasium at liberty so it's pretty cool uh, discovery canyon high school alumni ashton prechtel is making history you may have seen that name in the paper recently uh, ashton plays basketball for the university of stanford's women women's basketball team the same stanford university who just won the NCAA Basketball National Championship. Not only is she on the team, she's a significant contributor to the team, and in that championship game scored seven points, had eight rebounds, and three assists. So congratulations to both Ashton and her family who are still local here, and I'm sure extremely proud. Over the weekend, Thespians at Discovery Canyon Campus High School premiered their production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. What's more special is they performed this for a small, socially distanced, but live audience. This is a big step in the right direction as we navigate COVID-19 protocols and begin to recover. This year, 48 students in Academy District 20 are being recognized for their art submissions to the Air Academy Federal Credit Union Annual Art Show. Noah C. from Discovery Canyon Campus Middle School and Sequoia H. from Air Academy High School both won Best of Show. In total, more than $4,000 in scholarships will be awarded to District 20 students. And thank you again to uh, Mr. Sreeb and the Air Academy Federal Credit Union for sponsoring that. And lastly, um, I think some of you may know this person, uh, but she's one of our, I'll call it unsung, unsung heroes. Uh, Jennifer Weber from the district's IT department, and I would add alumni of Rampart High School. Not that I had anything to do with it, but she was a former student of mine. Uh, Jennifer recently won a national data polling contest hosted by Infinite Campus. She submitted, she wrote code and submitted that code uh, that allows staff to contact trace after a student presents with COVID-19 symptoms. The code allows staff to enter the date and the student, uh, the date the student was last in the building and then helps them find who the student may have come in contact with. So congratulations to Jennifer. And in a few seconds here, congratulations to the six folks and their friends and family that are waiting in the atrium for, uh, I believe, the next vote. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds, that's all I have. Thank you, I would have expected nothing less from Jen Weber. That's impressive. 
All right, so we're going to move on to the consent agenda and we need a motion to approve the following resolutions. 20, uh, 224 21 matter of approval of matters relating to administrative staff licensed. 225 21 approval of matters relating to staff specialist staff. 226 21 approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. 227 21 approval of matters relating to licensed staff licensed support slash special services provider. 228 21 approval of matters relating to classified staff. 229 21 approval of ENDS 1.2 character monitoring report. 230 21 approval of the monitoring report evaluation for ENDS 1.2 character. 231 21 approval of the annual GP 4.14 electronic attendance and participation in school board meetings. 232 21 approval of monitoring report evaluation for the same. 233-21, approval of the language revision to GP 4.14, electronic attendance and participation in school board meetings, and approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from April 1st, 2021. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. LaValle? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Ms. Reynolds? Aye. It appears that we have six brand new administrators who can now celebrate and we wish we could be there with you. Enjoy. It's nice to hear that applause, isn't it, you guys? Just let it go. It's next year, next year we'll be able to be out there with them, or they'll be in here with us. That's even better. We're going to move on to um, agenda item eight. It's items pulled from the consent agenda, and we have none. So we're going to move on to agenda item nine A, Challenger Learning Center of a Colorado Annual Update. Mr. Gregory. Yes, I would like to invite Mr. Ron Bush to the podium. If he can get through the crowd out there, find his way to the podium. He will be giving us uh, his the annual update from the Challenger Learning Center. And uh, I believe he may correct me, but I believe this is his first uh, in his new role uh, replacing Rob. Yeah, his there he is. Like We're ready. Sure. Yes. <laughs> All right, good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here and to share with you. Um, this is the third time that I've uh, had the, the chance to do this presentation on behalf of Challenger Learning Center. And, um, you know, it's one of my favorite presentations to do um, because, you know, speaking as a, a longtime employee of Challenger Learning Center and a D20 parent, um, we're just so privileged and proud to be have such a strategic partnership uh, with District 20 and everything that we can do. And then obviously so incredibly grateful for the support that you give us uh, each and every year. So I'll try and keep this presentation uh, fairly short. I've got basically three things that I wanna talk through with you all. Um, the first one being just uh, kind of an update on what we were able to accomplish in what I will refer to as the quiet time uh, last uh, spring and fall. And that was the time when we didn't have the voices of middle schoolers uh, in, inside our center. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit just to give you an update of programs and how things have been progressing uh, within Challenger Learning Center. And then also just uh, taking a step. Did I? I think I turned the microphone off again. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll start with uh, with that downtime that we had um, last spring. So in March when um, the school buildings shut down and everything moved online. I remember talking to my education team and saying, um, you know, this is a really great opportunity for us. Um, we've got the resources, we have the time, we have the creativity um, to really continue to move forward, even though we can't see students right now, um, so that uh, we can improve our programs, expand what we can offer students. So when we can open our doors again, uh, we can really uh, be better prepped uh, to do even more for the students that we serve. And, and I'm really happy to say, you know, it's hard to believe 13 months now uh, later, uh, I can stand here and say that we absolutely were able to do that. And so I'd like to talk just about a few of those things that we were able to accomplish that you see on that uh, initial slide there. Um, so immediately when schools went to online learning last March, the first thing that we wanted to do is make sure that we could continue to be a resource for our teacher community. Um, so we released a series of digital video lessons uh, designed for upper elementary, middle school uh, teachers that they could include in their online learning plans. Um, so these were lessons that were put together. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, these are lessons that were put together by our um, uh, by our education staff that were aerospace content and um, uh, hands on activities that the students could do. Teachers could send that out in their e-learning. Uh, students could do them individually. Teachers could do them in their teams lessons. Uh, and we really got great feedback from that, and we're just happy that we could be a resource for those teachers. So we released one uh, digital lesson a week um, for the last uh, two months of last school year. Now, um, before I jump to the start of this school year, the fall of 2020, I want to um, just share a little vision, and, and I recognize some faces, and I know some of you have probably heard this either from me or from uh, Rob Friedel, who was uh, the previous president and CEO of Challenger Learning Center. Um, we are very well known for our middle school simulator missions. Um, and so I know that on the board we have some parents uh, of, of former uh, kids that have come through the Challenger Learning Center. Um, but if you've talked to anyone in high school uh, or has gone through middle school in D20, uh, they'll probably remember their experience at Challenger Learning Center. And, and we absolutely love that. And, and it's so much fun to hear the stories about that. Um, and But that's not all that we want to be. And so, uh, like I said, if you've heard me talk or uh, Rob Friedel talk, um, we love that our kids, uh, the kids that come to us get a great experience in middle school, um, but we don't want that to be the only time that we get to engage students. And so uh, to us uh, and to me, my goal is to engage these kids continually year after year from the time they start kindergarten in District 20, culminating with that middle school um, emission or uh, emission experience. And so during, uh, well, I'll jump back. When we renegotiated uh, or, or reworked our agreement when we moved into the new facility uh, with between uh, District 20 and the Challenger Learning Center, uh, one of the things that we included was that addition of uh, $70,000 in funds that were designated for those programs. And, and that's the vision behind that, um, that those funds would be used to engage elementary school kids year after year in these challenger programs uh, and i think that persistent stem engagement can really make a difference uh, in these kids lives and and maybe what they decide to do as they uh, as they move forward in their school career so jumping back to some of the things that we were able to accomplish uh, one of the first things we did is we created a series of lessons which we call digital discoveries uh, these are standards-based programs for grades kindergarten through third grade uh, they uh, every program we do includes teacher training uh, the teachers get materials, uh, a box of materials to run these programs. Uh, they will do pre-lessons with the students, uh, and then it culminates with a live video uh, lesson uh, with one of our Challenger educa educators. So Steve Flannery, who is our teacher on special assignment with Challenger, was instrumental in getting those all set up. Uh, we ran a number of them this school year, and they've been really, really successful. In addition to those digital programs, uh, we have what we call e-missions, which you may have heard of. I'm happy to expand on a lot of this. Um, you know, I'll keep it short right now for time. Um, but those e-missions replicate the two and a half hour mission that we have in our simulator. Uh, and it's presented in a way that we can connect with the classroom without them needing to travel to our center or us travel to the school. And we've run these for over a decade now. Uh, we have a fourth grade emission, and then we have emissions that we run with middle school, but we had a, a hole or, or a gap in what we were able to offer fifth grade students. So we wrote a brand new emission called Lunar Outpost, which focuses on uh, the setting of that is our NASA's Artemis mission and our return to the moon. Uh, but the content for that emission is directly related to fifth grade math standards. Uh, we understand that now more than ever, uh, math and giving students real world experiences uh, to uh, practice the math skills that they've learned uh, is so important. And so uh, we're happy to have developed that and have been running um, a number of those programs this year. And then the last thing, which uh, I have to credit uh, Steve Flannery as well, he is our one man planetarium department. Um, but we, uh, Steve, rewrote um, all of our planetarium curriculum that we can provide for schools. So every single grade level, kindergarten through eighth grade has a standards based planetarium program that we can use in uh, our center in the Mickelson Planetarium that's in our new building and also in our portable planetarium that we take out to schools. Um, so we're very excited about that. And uh, a quick story uh, along with that, Steve was at Rock Rimmon Elementary School earlier this year, and I believe it was a first grade teacher um, came to him afterward and, uh, and uh, grabbed him aside and said, oh my gosh, everything that you did in that planetarium is ties in with what I'm teaching in science this year. And so we kind of laugh at that because of course that's our goal. Um, 
but it was a great realization and that's great uh you know it validates what we're doing that these teachers don't just see it as a wow experience for the kids that's really unique um, but they value it as a complement to what they're doing in the classroom so you know it was a weird fall it was a very quiet fall for us um, but you know between the programs that i just mentioned we now have a really great offering for uh, students really every grade level from k through eight and so i'm gonna point to Legacy Peak Elementary. We're lucky to have them as our neighbors, uh, and they were a great test model for us uh, this past year because every student at Legacy Peak, uh, thanks to you know our team at Challenger and uh, Katie Goodman, who is the STEAM teacher at Legacy Peak, um, every student at Legacy Peak Elementary got two Challenger experiences this year. So every kindergarten, first, second, and third grade class experienced digital discoveries. The fourth grade group and fifth grade group each did res their uh, respective emissions. And then every kid at um, uh, Legacy Peak came over and experienced our planetarium shows. So this is the model that I want to see uh, spread across the district, that we would be able to do that for every D20 elementary school that is willing and interested in doing that. Uh, thank you to Mr. Gregory for already uh, making some introductions and we've got, um, I'm gonna blank on the name now, Encompass Heights, did I get it right? Okay. Um, and uh, we talked with their STEM coordinator yesterday and said like, this is what we're able to offer you. And I'm so excited about that continued and deeper partnership that it's not just at the middle school level, but uh, across you know all the elementary grade levels as well. Um, sorry, do I advance the slides? Okay, next slide. Um, uh, so you know, beyond that, uh, I wanna talk just a, a little bit about uh, program numbers. Obviously these numbers are not what we're used to when we talk about students served and programs run. Um, I have the details in the in the report that I gave you. There were a number of D20 middle schools that weren't able to attend this year just because they were scheduled in the fall and fast. Most of those were between November, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, when that wave hit and everything kind of shut down a second time. Um, and then we had Timberview in January, which just couldn't make it work with their cohort schedules and things. So, uh, you know, having been in the classroom for 12 years, I cannot imagine what the teachers uh, have had to do and be flexible with. So obviously we didn't get the numbers uh, within the district that we were really uh, hoping for. Um, but that said, looking back now at what it could have been, we're, we're really excited um, with what we were able to accomplish. So uh, you see the numbers on the screen there. We ran you know, just over 300 total programs with schools. Um, all but 20 of those occurred after February 1st. Um, which uh, we've been very, very busy, but we've had kids uh, either connected with us digitally or in our center nearly every day since February 1st. Um, 90 of those programs were with the D20 uh, schools. So we did 38 of the digital or uh, emissions. Uh, we had 20 uh, groups come in person. So Mountain Ridge Middle School, Aspen Valley, uh, the Journey K-8 kids that were in person, um, the D20 Homeschool Academy, um, were all able to attend as planned. And, uh, and then Eagle View, is running emissions. They're scheduled in May. Um, they Their staff opted to go and run some emissions with us this spring, so we'll see them in May. So uh, 90 programs with D20 kids, um, that's you know over 4,000 students served. So again, it doesn't really compare to what we've done in the past, um, but to give a little bit of perspective, um, our last year in our old facility, which was um, our last full school year uh, that we've had in, in 2018-2019, um, we saw about 300 and ran about 390 programs in that entire school year. Uh, last year when things uh, shut down in March, we had run 373 programs uh, in just over eight months. Uh, and as I mentioned this year, we're at 313 programs uh, in just over four months. So what that tells me is with our expanded programs that we had the opportunity to create, um, the funding that uh, the district has provided for those elementary schools, uh, we will have a record year next year. We will be talking about how many additional students we've been able to serve. Um, and so I, I'm certainly excited about that. Um, and then uh, on the next slide, the last thing that I wanna kind of talk about is just uh, looking ahead, kind of what's happening the rest of the school year um, and, then, uh, and then into the summer. Um, right now, booking is open for next school year, so we already have uh, engaged the uh, D20 middle schools. Uh, like I said, the STEM coordinator and Compass Health, and we have our uh, usual suspects, the teachers within D20 that do programs year after year uh, and know the date on the calendar and our registrar's email uh, or phone is ringing off the hook. Um, and so we're very excited about that. We're, we're hoping for a very normal school year next year, as, as I'm sure we all are. 
Um, Steve Flannery, our D20 uh, teacher on special assignment, has renewed his time with us, so he will be here for another uh, with us for another two school years. Uh, I know we're super excited about that, and and he is as well. Uh, he has been just a great addition, and I. I love to point out uh, he came to us from Pine Creek High School uh, as a literature and PE teacher, uh, track and cross country coach, and to watch him write, develop curriculum and run it with kindergarten and first grade groups is just awesome. Uh, he has done a phenomenal job uh, and is, is so great at what he does. So he's, he's been a, a huge asset to our team at Challenger. Um, we will have uh, 15 weeks of summer camp uh, this summer. Um, including six uh, individual camps, uh, week-long camps at Legacy Peak Elementary. Um, and so I've already talked to Mr. Gregory a little bit about how we can spread that word across the district. We would love to fill those summer camps up with the 20 students and just give them increased opportunity uh, in person to, uh, to expand on what, we've, what they've done this school year. Um, we do each year, for some of you, I think most of you have heard, we do an annual teacher STEM boot camp each year. Um, the goal behind that is to uh, to put on a hands-on uh, STEM education work workshops for teachers and then let them leave with materials for their classroom. So we use outside funding for that. Um, year to year, that funding uh, can differ, but each year teachers that attend uh, usually with, with between about $200 or $400 worth of robotics kits, classroom materials to take back and actually put into practice the things that they've learned. So we're very proud of that. Um, I'm uh, professional development uh, for teachers is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, and so it's one of my favorite things that we get to do each year. Uh, we had to cancel last year, but this year we are going to do two days in person and then have a virtual option for any teachers that would like to attend uh, and cannot do so or don't want to do in person. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention as far as um, you know things coming down uh, down the road, one of the things that got canceled this past year um, with our new facility and the increased space, uh, we had planned to do uh, more public programs uh, for our community. And uh, we call those second Saturday science events. If you're familiar, Home Depot, uh, I know they used to, uh, I don't know if they still do, used to run a Saturday workshop for families and kids. Uh, I've got three boys um, under the age of 12. We spent every Saturday or that, that Saturday uh, for probably three or four straight years at Home Depot making projects. So that's my vision behind this. But uh, instead of a Home Depot project, they get to come to the Challenger Learning Center. They get to do a hands on STEM activity uh, with their family. And then each month we'll do a different show uh, in our planetarium. And so we'll find outside funding for that um, so that it is something that's free and available to the public. So something that we're really excited about and really looking forward to getting off the ground. So you know, just to kind of summarize, um, you know, I, I, I hope you understand how uh, appreciative we are of everything that the district does uh, for our center from that amazing facility. And I know this was not the year to go visit places. Uh, I know some of you may have seen the new facility when we did the grand opening, but there's always an open invitation if you want to come uh, and, and see what we get to do in person. Uh, we would absolutely love to have you. Um, but the facility is wonderful and it not only lets us engage students more, but also, like I mentioned, uh, even the public in our community. Um, support for sending the middle school groups year after year after year and creating one of the great experiences uh, of their middle school education timeline. Um, the additional program funding that I'm hoping we'll be able to in, in incorporate uh, a number of new elementary schools this year. And then obviously the TOSA position that we have that just boosts our education staff greatly. Um, you know, your continued support really help give us a great year in what could have been a very, very negative year. Um, and uh, and we're now in a place uh, where your support is going to reach tens of thousands of students, uh, not just in District 20, uh, but across the city um, in you know year, year after year. So uh, on behalf of myself, uh, the Challenger Board, our Challenger staff, uh, thank you so much for your support. So I know I always ask for questions. If you have any anything that I can answer for you about what we're doing at Challenger, uh, I'd yes, love to have it sounds them. like Mrs. Conninger might have a question. We'll start with her. Thank you. Okay. Um, I hail from the Neil Armstrong namesake. My maiden name is Armstrong, okay. so we always used to love to play on that. My dad was a sixth grade teacher. Okay. Um, and one of our very first things as this current board was to go and do a mission with Rob. I think Rob was the one that was helping us. It was so much fun. And I have told every single person I've met that they need to take advantage. We also have those little mini hammers from Home Depot. So I know exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. And as I watched you, my image of that man that uh, helped land the Mars rover 
came into play because of your passion for the project that you're a part of. And I, I really appreciate that about that um, amazing facility. I, as we were looking at those numbers, I wondered, um, and maybe you said this and I apologize, but um, you were talking about how many D20 missions. Did you also have other districts that you were still working with this year or was that kind of cut short as well? I mean, uh, I imagine it was, but. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So, um, and of course I don't have the total numbers. I believe uh, if everything continues this spring as planned, uh, we'll have just under 80 missions. Okay. Uh, we've seen a shift this year from, uh, I mean, obviously District 11 and District 20 send uh, large groups and, and, and the number of schools. Um, we've seen been able to engage a lot of homeschool academy and, mm -hmm. and smaller groups like that. Um, a lot of charter schools this year and as well as just some smaller districts that don't have some of the logis logistical challenges and busing challenges. So, um, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mr. Lumber. You didn't lose any staff at all this year? Uh, no, we did not. Um, that, it, we are so grateful. Um, there are 40 challenger centers across the United States. Um, some are like ours and our standalone nonprofits. Some sit within districts, uh, some are on college campuses. Um, and so we meet about once a month as a as an organization. Um, and some of them had suffered significant losses um, uh, in staffing that they needed to cut. Uh, we are one of the few that didn't need to cut any staff uh, and we're so grateful for that. And um, and we're one of the few that are still engaging uh, students. So, um, you know, we are very, very grateful. And that you know, goes to, um, you know, my predecessor and, and, and my challenger board that put us in a successful spot, um, the support of District 20, uh, and then a lot of our external funders that really made that possible. So, you know, Ron, you, you've really been challenged in the last year or so, particularly with how you do things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard enough in the classroom, but yours makes it even more difficult. So I, I am impressed with what you've told us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you very much. We we all love what we do, and uh, it's you know we've we've been flexible and creative, and it's worked out well. Mr. Lavalle. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bridge. Th this was great, uh, and I I fully support our investment in the Challenge and Learning Center, and and it's I just wish you had a little more enthusiasm. That's all. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I've been told. That. <laughs> no, it's it's great. It it, it that. That I'm sure that's part of the success. Um, do other school districts invest in the Challenge and Learning Center or are we the only one? Um, meaning financially? Well, financially, yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, we get, if you're talking just um, unrestricted donation, uh, we get $40,000 a year from districts that aren't through District 20. Um, we do have commitments. I'll use the word commitments or, or uh, agreements with other school districts uh, that are program related. So the, easy, the easiest example of that is, is District 11. Uh, they send us like District 20, they send us every uh, sixth grade class each year. So uh, on end, that ends up being, you know, about a, depending on the number of classes between like a 50 or $60,000 investment uh, in programs that year. So everything else is on a much smaller scale uh, as far as a dist district level. Uh, a lot of it is, is school driven, um, but from time to time we'll get um, a district that may get some funding and they want us to help them put on a summer camp or a teacher professional development. So does that sufficiently answer your question? It sure does. Okay. Yeah, like I say, great, great program and thanks for all you do. Well, thank you. Well, echo my colleagues, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> yeah. And you know, as I was reading this report, I thought, you no, know, we talk about resilience mm -hmm. all the time. And I just keep being reminded that we have that in District 20 yeah. programs like yours and others and teachers who are willing to put out so much to yeah. do good things for kids. So our kids continue to learn even during all this. So thank you for your yeah. report and thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Next time we need to do the questions first because I totally get relaxed. It's when I have to prepare these, play, have these planned comments that I get uh, nervous and tongue tied. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. It's great to be here and I, I look forward to uh, wowing you with amazing numbers uh, next year. So thanks. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item 9B, and this is legislative updates. Mr. Gregory. Yes, I'm hoping Ms. Thompson is with us virtually and she can take it from there. I am. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Good evening. I wanted to provide you with an update and let you know that we're monitoring roughly 80 education related bills at this time. 
However, I'd like to first talk about the work going on related to school finance. And so I'll bring us back to this bill summary in front of you in just a moment. But if you'll bear with me, I'm going to try to summarize where we are with our current funding forecasts. You like you'll you're likely to recall that a long list of education program uh, was laid over last year as the legislature struggled to balance our 2021 budget in the face of the pandemic related uncertainties about our state revenues. The main budget bill is Senate Bill 21205, also known as the Long Bill, along with nearly two dozen companion measures was considered by the Senate this week. Some of the JVC's key proposals, and you don't have to scroll through the um, summary. Um, this is just a summary of the long bill, and this information is not in that summary. This is um, more current as to what was going on this week with our JVCs and some of the our JVC and some of its key proposals for restoring funding to education programs. So the long bill is occupying most of, of the time and the focus of the Senate this week. Um, some of the key proposals for restoring funding to our programs include behavior health priorities. Uh, they, they're looking at three million in marijuana revenues for behavioral health professionals grant program. There's a school safety allocation of 250,000 in marijuana revenues to enhance school safety incident response program in the Department of Public Safety, social and emotional health, two and a half million in marijuana revenues for CDE's K-5 social and emotional health grant program. And transition to high school, there's 800,000 being considered from the general fund uh, given to ninth grade student success program. Advanced courses, $250,000 is being earmarked in the general fund to grant programs for districts who use automatic enrollments of students in advanced courses. And lastly, charters, $2.8 million is earmarked uh, in an all funds increase for mill levy equalization payments, aid to the charter school institute schools to partially match funding district schools um, receive for special property taxes. But this week, the toughest hit to K-12 education, of course, was the decision to double the budget stabilization, or as we know it by the BS factor, from $572 million to $1.17 billion. Another big reduction went to the cash grants fund of Building Excellent Schools Today, or we also know that as the best construction program, which lost $100 million um, in order to balance the previous 2020-21 budget. So while the JVC was allocating some of the state's one-time revenue surplus, it decided to move an extra 100 million to special education funding, uh, I'm sorry, the state education fund, the SEF, and set aside 1 million in startup costs for Proposition EE. And you may recall that was the ballot measures voters approved last year to raise taxes on our nicotine products. Those revenues are eventually will be used for early childhood programs. Additionally, there's funding allocated for a significant set of new programs intended to improve teacher recruitment and retention. So this is measure Senate Bill 21185, supporting educator workforce in Colorado. And in this packet in front of you, it's noted on page 10, but just to provide you with a summary, it's intended to first to upgrade two existing programs. One, the quality teacher recruitment program and the educator loan forgiveness program. Both of those were cut in 2021 budget, but with funding restored in this current per budget proposal. The bill would also create two new programs First off, the Teacher Recruitment Education and Preparation Program, which would allow participants to concurrently enroll in post-secondary courses for two years following their senior year in high school. And secondly, the, sec the Educator Recruitment and Retention Program, which would provide support to members in the armed forces, non-military affili affiliated educator candidates, and school districts to recruit and retain qualified educators. Another provision of the bill makes it easier to hire adjunct instructors with expertise in specific fields. 
So the bill's original fiscal note was 2.3 million, but the JBC set aside 13.4 million for the new programs and restoration of two existing programs. So that's, I think, both good news and bad news, depending upon how you look at it. Moving along, um, also orbiting our long bill re related to assistance for Colorado schools is Senate Bill 21207. This is public school capital construction assistance fund transfer, which as mentioned would return 100 million to the best fund, the Building Excellent Schools Today Capital Construction Fund that the General Assembly took away last year. Also, Senate Bill 21-228, Para Public Employees Retirement Association Payment Cash Fund would create a fund to allocate general fund dollars to the Public Employees Retirement Association. This particular transfer was created back in the 2018 legislative session under Senate Bill 18-200, which was implemented to help with the Para unfunded liabilities. So as discussed in my previous update, um, Senate Bill 182, the school discipline bill, that bill was um, discussed as an overview as to what it would mean um, for school discipline and school resource officers within our schools. When that bill was introduced, there was a great deal of attention that came after its in introduction. Um, the bill was very dense. It spanned more than 30 pages and covered a wide range of items related to school discipline. But the section of the bill that seemed to get the most public attention was section six as introduced and it related to how law enforcement would be able to interact with students. Ultimately, uh, advocates on both sides of this particular bill could not agree on amendments or a version that would support students and at the same time respect the role of law enforcement. So the bill was postponed indefinitely, pulled by the sponsors and will not move forward in this legislative session. So now turning back to our packet, on page one, if you'll scroll down, you'll see House Bill 21 This is the Public Information Applicants for Public Employment Bill. And this was introduced to clarify the current open meetings law and CORA or the Colorado Open Records Act as they interact and relate to a public body hiring of a chief executive officer. I'm very proud to share that Mr. Lavalley did a fine job representing the district in his testimony before the House Committee in late March. And after testimony, this bill passed out of the House on third reading with an overwhelming 50 yes, three. 13 no and two excused votes. Last week, this bill was introduced in the Senate and it's set to be heard next week on April 20th in the Senate State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. I believe that Mr. Lavalley has agreed to testify before the committee on behalf of the district and I'm confident that he will represent the district just as well this second time. Moving on to page four, if you will, House Bill 1164. Thank you, That's, that looks great. Uh, is, this is the continuation of the work from last year's School Finance Act and acknowledges the general fund mills of local school districts had been lowered wrongly by CDE for years. After some districts held elections to what we call D. Bruce. So with support from voters to keep the revenues over the Tabor limits, local mill levies should not have been driven down by Tabor and Gallagher amendments. Um, significantly, the current bill directs CDE to make that correction rather than districts being forced to increase taxes. Um, this bill will put a replacement plan in place to raise the mills to the voter approved le levels over time. It was approved in the House and now it's in the Senate for consideration. On page five, if you will. House Bill 1246. Perfect, thank you. Uh, this is a bill that seeks to uh, para divestment from fossil fuel companies. 
in response to some political concerns around global warming um, and just the environmental impacts. But this bill seeks to require the para board within one year after the effective date to create an exclusion list of all direct investments in para um, to create an exclusion list of all direct investments that Para has in fossil fuel companies. Within six months after completing that exclusion list, the board would then be required to determine whether divestment from companies on the list complies with the board's fiduciary obligations. And if the bill does determine that divestment from any company on the exclusion list complies with its fiduciary duty, the board would then be required to divest from those companies on the exclusion list. And the board would be required to cease new direct investments in any company that is a fossil fuel company. Lastly, beginning one year after the effective date of this bill, the board would be required to ensure that no money or assets of the fund are invested in, in an indirect investment vehicle unless the board is satisfied that such investment vehicle is unlikely to have excess of 2% of its assets directly or indirectly invested in fossil fuel companies. So keeping in mind, PARA serves as the singular purpose for ensuring the retirement security of Colorado's current and former public servants. Global issues are very difficult to prioritize and proper recourse falls beyond the duty of the retirement system. So this is a bill we'll continue to watch and I will provide you with an update as it as it progresses. If you will, turning to page six, Senate Bill 2117. This it, bill was this particular bill was introduced early on. We have talked about it in our previous updates, but just as a refresher, um, it provides an educator who subjects a secondary school student who is 18 years of age to sexual contact that they would then have committed a crime of abuse of public trust by an educator so long as the educator is, a, is at least four years older than that student. So this bill is under consideration in the House Judiciary Committee. It has been there for a little while, but we will continue to monitor and watch. At this time, that concludes this concludes my legislative updates and what questions may may I answer for the board at this time? I, I'm seeing nothing right now, Mrs. Thompson. OK, we do have one, but while well, I'm on roll, can I just verify that um, Senate Bill 21207? I just really not a verification, but really a reminder that that doesn't really impact us the best grant money. Um, but you, you you had brought it up, so I wanted to verify that we're not we're not receiving any funding from that. Is that correct? Uh, well, we don't currently receive funds from the best grant, but it doesn't mean that we wouldn't be able to access funds in, in the future, um, especially as it relates to some of the, the new um, federal funding that is coming, but yet has not yet been allocated. Those allocations have yet to be determined, but there are some smaller projects. Our, our district has done very well in, in our capital construction and funding our capital construction projects outside of having to apply for best grant opportunities. But there are some opportunities should the district have a desire that we could potentially apply for, um, such as like say an HVAC update or something, a roof. Those are, those are smaller capital construction projects that um, while we don't have any current grant funding for those, we could potentially consider those options in the future. I, I agree. I just want the reason I bring that up is people ask frequently. So what's happening to that marijuana money in our district? Nothing. Um, and um, I, I just want to make that clear and that may not happen in the future either. But it is beneficial for rural districts in our state. I know that and that's nice to see happening. But I uh, just want to verify that we're not doing that yet. But maybe there is hope. Mrs. Thompson. Uh, Mr. Little Valley. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Just as an aside to um, best money TCA, the classical academy has gotten best money in the past. I would not be surprised. I have not talked with anybody at New Summit. That would be perhaps a, a place where they may need money for for, for something. I, I don't know. I'm right. just I'm, I'm speculating here, but, but that's a possibility. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Thompson, for your, your kind words. I, uh, question about 1051, that's the one about uh, the, the single finalist. I initially got real concerned when I saw it went into the veterans, uh, th that's the kill committee. And, and, and generally speaking, when something goes there, it goes to die. Can you comment on that? Certainly. Well, the, it is a legitimate um, committee that, that does review um, bills as well. Um, yes, there are bills that go there and, and tend to be postponed indefinitely or laid over the, in other words, they die on the clock. But this is actually a bill that has, it, our bill has been ca calendar, and I say our bill only because we have great interest in just getting some clarity from our legislature on this issue. Um, so I, I think that the fact that it's been calendar, it's set to be heard, is really a uh, good sign that, that this bill is moving as we would expect in any other committee it could have been assigned to. Yeah, thanks. It, it makes sense because when it passed the House, I would say overwhelmingly, I think that's a good phrase, I would be shocked if, if it went to die. Um, can you, 1059, House Bill 1059, uh, I was real confused because this bill prohibits an education provider from prohibiting. So in other words, it can't, it, it prevents somebody from stopping them to a lot, to have, to prevent an online student's parents from being present while the student participates in online instruction. Am I correct? We don't we don't do that, do we? Do, do, are there districts that actually prohibit their parents from from listening in and, and seeing what's going on with their kid? Well, I certainly can't speak to what's happening in other districts. We don't have any um, policy or procedures that would preclude a parent from listening in or even being present in the room, so long as it doesn't get disrupt become disruptive to the educational setting for that particular student. Um, but also in this bill, it seeks to limit other um, remedies for behavior or conduct violations that could occur in an online classroom environment. Um, and so I think the idea of limiting the school's authority to provide discipline for misconduct um, would be an impact to our district because we have in this time of COVID and remote learning, um, had to address some conduct violations that uh, implicated our pol our current policies, albeit happening in an online environment. Um, if this bill were to have been in effect at that particular time, our ability to address that would have been much more limited by some of that language. So um, maintaining local control and allowing our boards to determine whether or not discipline for behavior is appropriate, I, I think is always in the best interest of our district in particular, but also trying to meet the ends and objectives of our educational programming, um, whether it be delivered in person or having to be necessitated for delivery in an online setting. Okay, thanks. I, I just, yeah, I appreciate that. House Bill 12 of 1210, so I know that the, the feds basically have have legalized, if you will, I'll, I'll say 529 money uh, for use in in um, in uh, education expenses for K K12. So, but I don't think Colorado has ever codified that, and this this bill would codify that. Is that am I reading that correctly? Uh, yeah, you are. You are cre uh, reading that correctly. Um, it is allowing for that. Um, distributions to the 529 in, uh, account to include um, repayment of educational loans or um, different type of educational programming. The question that I would have around this is just whether or not there's limitations on the, the entities that the, these payments are being transferred to, whether or not they're public or private entities. And if we're using public funds and to, to transfer to private entities. I think that that could um, potentially have some challenges to overcome, but um, you, you are, your interpretation as you've stated is correct. All right, thanks. I, I mean, I know my son goes to a private college and I take 529 money to pay for that. So I, I don't know that that would be an issue, but that is a good, is a good point. Um, and I was glad it's about time 
I hope House Bill uh, 17 becomes law. That's the one uh, uh, sexual contact with somebody who's 18. Uh, it's about time this becomes law. Glad to see that. And I was very glad to see Senate Bill 182 died, hopefully forever, but at least for this legislative session. And, and I do look forward, if I'm available, to, to testify for uh, 1051. If I'm not out of town, I bet you uh, Ms. Reynolds would be would be able to do that as well. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it, Ms. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. And just for reference, it's scheduled for the 20th. And so I don't know what your work schedule looks like for the 20th, but that would be the date that we would be looking at for that testimony. Yeah, I'm out of the country, unfortunately. Right, schedule. There is a remote option. I don't know what the time, I don't know how time um, zones will line up, but um, th there is that option. Mr. Lavalley doesn't sleep, so he can <laughs> get on it. Yeah, time. actually. And if not, I'm happy to. Sleep. Yeah, 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 thanks. We'll talk, Mrs. Thompson. Certainly. Anybody else? You know, 80 bills isn't very many. Sorry, just kidding. All right. Well, it's um, early. Keep in mind, we don't adjourn in May. Like in a typical year, we would adjourn around the first week of May. But that's that's been pushed back because we recessed for about a month as soon as we um, convened in session. So um, we're not as far along in this legislative session as one may feel we are since it's April. Um, so the, the, the whole picking up the pace has yet to be felt. <laughs> when do they adjourn? The first week of June. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. I don't see any other questions or comments from the board. Thank you for keeping us updated about where we are with these bills uh, going forward. Thank you. Let's go on to 9C, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Update. Mr. Gregory. Yes, Dr. Peak, please. Well, good evening again. Wasn't that a great celebration? It's exciting with our new administrators. So uh, I was just going to say, it's clear that we're trying to keep you really busy before yes. you leave. <laughs> yes, <Sorry>. yes. <laughs> That's right. wondering when that extra stipend is going to come in, but I don't yeah, think right. it's coming. Yeah, we, we wonder that every day too, Dr. Peter. So, yes, okay. this is true. This is the wrong audience to appeal to. <laughs> um, as you are aware, we're currently involved in our diversity, equity, inclusion work uh, per the superintendent's initiative with the support of our consultants and lead facilitator, uh, Dr. Landon Mascarenas from the Colorado Education Initiative, CEI. To date, a multitude of data has been collected, analyzed, and is being shared in discussions with our DEI task force. This data includes student assessment data, behavior data, enrollment data, program descriptions, and other enrollment trends, as well as relevant administrative policies. The task force, uh, which I think I shared last month, uh, has eclipsed 55. I think we're around 60 folks representing a diverse group of students, staff, and parents and community members. We've now met uh, for the third time. We just met this past uh, Tuesday, just a couple of days ago. Um, power of the participants being vulnerable, speaking their truth, and committing to the improvement of our school district is certainly profound and to be commended. From the March 9th, uh, March 30th, and as indicated, April 13th, meetings the task force is engaged in, uh, personal stories and equity narratives of Academy 20, data and policy reflections regarding student outcomes and students' experiences. There's been a student panel discussion. There's data and policy reflections regarding access to opportunities and family and community experiences. There's also been a family and community discussion, panel discussion. Uh, and I just want to share anecdotally uh, this past uh, Tuesday with the family and, and community and parent uh, panel discussion it was interesting to hear and, and really profound that parents from all different from many different perspectives were, were stating both that everyone should be on board with this work and moving forward, yet other parents and, and uh, family perspectives saying, wait a second, we need to make sure that we are uh, 
uh, including all diverse perspectives. And uh, so it just it was really powerful to hear that there's such a diverse uh, dichotomy of thought uh, and, and ultimately around a, a goal of having the shared reality of what's fair. And I think that that's going to help in uh, the task force effort uh, uh, to provide some meaningful recommendations. Um, our next meeting is on April 27th. This is going to be a longer meeting. Um, we have more work to do. It's going to include some data and policy reflections regarding our resources and supports and educator experiences. We're going to do a little deeper dive in some of the policy review. Uh, an educator and staff panel discussion will also happen on the 27th. And then again to start uh, just uh, uh, begin to identify some potential recommendations. And if you remember from one of the first uh, presentations that in which uh, both Alex and Landon were a part of speaking about audit to action. So part of the goal is to have um, some level of district recommendations that are aligned to the audit framework. And then this has been shared in a previous slide with you from last month. But uh, there are six components for audit framework, equity in student outcomes, equity in student access to opportunities, equity in resources and supports. And then the other three are around experiences, so equity in students, families and staff members, school experiences. The other part of recommendations anticipated is some ongoing learning recommendations and that could include possible next steps with the task force into next year. It is important to note, though, that the task force recommendations will be bound within the scope of the charge per the collaborative input model. Informed recommendations that address any findings that support our mission and meet expectations for diversity, equity, inclusion with regard to marginalized populations. And the task force on diversity, equity, inclusion will provide advisement recommendations related to the issue and goal statements as defined by the superintendent. The scope is limited to the issues outlined in the task force's charge. So this is not a policy or decision making task force, and it's a good reminder for us all. Rather, the task force will be making recommendations to the superintendent. The final meeting is scheduled for May 11 with an anticipated goal of finalizing recommendations from the task force to be shared with the superintendent by the end of the school year, which would include also a final report from CEI regarding equity audit analysis of the data, some additional recommendations uh, and some other maybe considerations for, for future work. So that's all to say, I think in, the, in a larger context, um, that we've engaged in some very rich conversations. We've looked at some meaningful data and that's already started to prompt the task force to start thinking about what are some things that would be tangible for recommendations uh, as early as into this next year and also uh, likely a need for some continuation either task force as it's formed now or maybe some groups that are smaller uh, or broken out uh, into the future. But um, just from my perspective, I think this is just the beginning of needed work and uh, it's large work. It will take time. And um, but I, I know that uh, it's been very exciting. And I would say uh, personally also that one of the most powerful things has been listening to the panel discussion. So when we get toward the end of each of our uh, task force meetings and we've been looking at data and broken in small groups, then Landon has facilitated uh, some open-ended questions for a panel of students. And then, like I mentioned this last Tuesday, a panel of family and parent uh, perspectives, community perspectives. It's just very powerful to hear people's perspectives and their real passion and commitment um, about moving forward. So we're excited to hear from educators and staff on the committee on the 27th again, but uh, very moving. And uh, we'll be pleased to bring back some more information to you um, I was uh, anticipating to maybe have a few slides of everything I shared verbally, but I promise I will provide <laughs> some notes for you for the minutes. But our last meeting was just this last Tuesday, so sharing this just verbally with you this evening. So, Dr. Pete, can I ask you a question real mm -hmm. quick tied to one of your last comments so I don't forget? Sure. Um, you said that there's panels at the end. So mm -hmm. are these people who are part of the committee or people yes. who are brought in? No, these okay. are, they're, they're a part of the committee. Oh, okay. So in light okay. of conversation and engaged work that we're having, then it's what, so what, what are, what are okay. you taking away from 
the, the data that we're looking at, the data that we've been discussing. When we're breaking into groups, it's very mixed, mm -hmm. right? So sure. students with adults, staff with parents, it's it's absolutely randomized with the groups. So great. Right. Thank you. Yep. Um, Heather, Mrs. Conger. I go by Heather. Um, <laughs> thank you, Karen. <laughs> well, I thought maybe the audience Reynolds. might like to know to whom I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I had some weird reverb on here. Um, I'm glad you addressed that because I actually would love to get some of those notes that you were just reading from just because um, I do want to hear that detail. So I, I don't want to put more on your plate because I realize that. But if you could even email out what you had, that would be awesome. Pleased to do so. Yeah, um, I, I had a random question in my head and I apologize if this goes uh, deviates from what you're trying to do, but um, who pays for the CEI group? Where does that funding come from? So uh, we have dollars available and Mr. Gregor maybe wants to speak to that. It's it's out of. It's district funds. I mean, there's not like a special funding source if that's yeah, I just didn't it. know where that was coming from. And so I was just wondering where like what bucket we were yeah, dealing with. It's uh, I'd have to we'd have to ask Becky Miss okay. Allen specifically for the the exact source, but it's it would be like out of my budget or Dr. Peak's budget or a combination of the two, or maybe there's a third. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a professional learning type of expense, but. Okay, I just, and I apologize for hitting you with that. I'm not trying to look for specific. I mean, I, I wanted to know um, how that happened um, just because I couldn't remember. I, um, I was surprised that it's the last meeting with this group is May. Right, so they're they're done in May, like that's disbanded or no, not necessarily. Okay, yeah. So that's that still remains to be seen. Uh, from my perspective, I would be quite surprised that this group wouldn't continue, or some form of this group would continue into the fall, maybe in smaller groups, or maybe still as a larger task force into the fall. I I would likely anticipate that would be part of some recommendations that would come out, but I, okay. I can't speak on behalf of the full task force at this juncture about where they're going to land with that. But I think there's a sense that there's a there's a lot of information to digest, mm -hmm. a lot of information to to sift through to start identifying themes and areas for focus. And um, so I, I think this is really just the beginning of the work, how it looks moving forward. I don't know that I could clearly articulate that yet, but I do have a a pretty strong sense that those who have been involved thus far have uh, felt quite engaged and are are eager um, to do good work with good recommendations, but also eager to move from this audit information into something that's actionable. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say that's the slide I yeah. want to see is yeah. the audit to action piece. So yeah. um, I know that that's it is like you said a lot to digest. So I appreciate the work that all of you are doing. I imagine it's all still virtual. Um, it, it is, and again, as I think I shared from last month, uh, there's there's probably both some pros and cons to that. Um, one of the pros right now is that you can really do some unique uh, mixing and matching of Breakouts. different groups, mm -hmm. and you can do that very, very quickly uh, versus human beings in a room and saying, okay, you three or four are going to over here, and, and we lose a lot of time that way. Um, people have their cameras on, they're actively engaged, we, we've got some basic protocols for conversation and discussion. Lots of voices are being heard. Uh, there's some also some some web based tools where then the, the task force then engages and adds um, just thoughts and reflections as well. So that's part of the work that's happening right now, too. So okay. lots lots of interaction during the time that we're together, even though it's virtual. OK, yep. thank you. Mr. Gregory, did you want to add something? Yeah, just I would just add. Ms. Conjure, your question. I'm I'm less interested in a in a timeline slash deadline than I am in doing it well and doing it right. So Dr. Peek and I have talked about, you know, there there needs to be a deliverable, um, or their perception could be that that action is just getting kicked kicked down the road. Um, but it may not be the end of the process. It may be the start. Uh, and then there's still work that the whole task force or a portion of the task force 
needs to keep going on. So I I've talked to uh, we've talked to Dr. Peak about I, you know yes there needs to be something um, at no less than maybe the the audit results, um, but I would expect my sense is that there will be continuation of this that it's not going to it feels really abrupt to me. I'll just put it that way. It's it's a lot of I sat in on the meeting where the first set of data was presented. It's a lot. Uh, I mean, it was it was a whole lot of data to try to digest and, and really do anything with. So if I may uh, back to the frame and this was the six boxes from last month's uh, slide from last month's presentation I shared. Uh, the audit framework, so those that I just rattled off, uh, student outcomes, student access to opportunities, resources. You can just take one of those components, so equity and student outcomes, that alone could be sizable work. Sure. Just on that, and, and I think where likely the task force will be focused on is looking to see are there one or two kind of sizable recommendations to, to do more work just in, even in that area. That could prompt uh, further engaged work of maybe a subcommittee or something that's that's helping to define and, and give credence and recommendation to actionable items off of that. So, yeah. Sorry, I have one more question, and that is that you know we've had a lot of people that have come in both pro and and against um, <clears throat> any kind of DEI work change in general. Um, and you said that you have a lot of representation on that committee, which I imagine is both sides of that coin. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't even know that I could define as like two separate sides. I mean, every every person that's on this task force comes with their own unique perspectives, no matter their own background, their own experiences, lived experiences. It's very diverse. Very diverse. Yeah, I've seen yeah. the names of, of who's on there and I can appreciate that. I just wonder, um, you know, anyway, it's going to it's going to be like anything, how we um, choose to um, communicate that to the public to um, address that with our you know staff and change that needs to happen. Um, and I think that that's hugely important. So I would say maybe a seventh box, <laughs> just a <laughs> communication factor. Yeah, and <laughs> indeed, that will be very important. Indeed. Mr. Valley. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Dr. Peak. Yes. Um, I, you kind of answered. Actually, you did answer the first one. Uh, my question: When do you expect the task force to make recommendations? I get it, and that's fine. I, yeah. I, I, I agree. With Mr. Gregory said, "Let's do it right instead of doing it quick." So no, no problem there. Um, how will those recommendations be made public? And that may be a Mr. Gregory question. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I don't want to answer for Mr. Gregory. I would just say that as part of our collaborative input model process we've used for years in this district is that a committee or task force such as this ultimately makes recommendations to the superintendent. The superintendent then in turn would determine what would potentially be the best method for communicating that, whether to the board, back to staff, leadership, community, and I'm sure there will be engaged conversations we'll be having in the next several weeks about that. Sure. What I what I would say, Mr. Lavalle, is that um, the recommendations that would come to me, um, the timing of that, uh, and Ms. Reynolds and I have to work on the uh, agenda planning piece of that. But uh, the next most immediate board meeting uh, following that is uh, when I would hope to share with the board, which means the public, on what those recommendations were. At that point, probably wouldn't be ready to. Uh, commit yay or nay to individual recommendations, uh, but I would certainly be happy to hear the discussion uh, that the board is having. Is having uh, and then uh, following that, um, in the past we've even responded uh, in writing, uh, kind of a written response. Um, essentially, it's back to the task force, I think, mm -hmm. um, as to what, what action will or will not take place based on each of the recommendations. So if there's 10 recommendations, there's like 10 responses, if you will, uh, that says here's what is or is not going to happen with this recommendation or maybe deferred to you know, a, a phase, a second phase or a third phase. Um, but depending on when the, the committee or the task force produces their work, it would be soon after that that it would come to the board. I know I'm 
one of five, and I know we have a policy governance model, and I fully understand that. I would like to, I would like for us to hear from CEI slash the task force about the recommendations, why they made those recommendations, why they why they feel that those recommendations will positively impact the district. I don't know how the rest of you feel about that. I would just add, and I was going to make a comment about our collaborative input model. Um, we're going to go back to a number of years ago when we ran, Mr. Gregory and I ran a transportation fee task force, and we used a collaborative input model, and it came back to uh, the superintendent, who sees it first because it is, after all, his committee and it's his initiative. And then he brought it forward uh, to the board and the board had a heavy discussion about it. Absolutely. So I would say that that's possible, Mr. LaValle, if that's what Mr. Gergen feels like would be good to have a few spokes, folks, spokes, folks, <laughs> spokes, <Here. folks>. um, <laughs> spokes, people here to um, discuss that. Some of that too, that recommendation night. Absolutely. Um, I remind us that that those are not voted on by the board. Those are absolutely, there should be transparency and the public hears it when, we're, when we hear it. But I do think that um, we, uh, you, you said it, we're not a poli we are a policy governance board, so we don't vote on them, but we absolutely get weigh in with the discussion. And that's what you said too, Mr. Gregory, is that we get to say what we feel like saying the night and, that the recommendations are presented. And how that happens is up to you. Although Mr. Lavalle just gave you one suggestion and there may be others, so. Yep. And we'll talk, to, I can talk to Dr. Peek about the, uh, I do think there's value uh, in hearing from, yep. uh, yeah. nothing against Dr. Peek, but not just from Dr. Peek, um, but maybe there's Dr. Peek and a parent and a student and somebody from CEI or, you know, kind of a, uh, a representative group, or we'll call it a diverse group within the committee that uh, reports out on, on the recommendations too, because I, I, I won't be able to answer Right. some of the questions possibly about where did this come from or why or what data drove this or yeah. those kinds of things. Thanks. I, I also, if I may, just in, maybe to, um, I don't know that the recommendations this early on in this work would be very granular, mm -hmm. right? So the recommendations are still likely going to be kind of higher, I don't know how else to describe it, but it, it, uh, it's not likely to come out with some very discrete action at this juncture. There's there's such a wealth of data and information to process. I imagine many of these recommendations will launch us into work into the coming year or the Task next couple of work, years. Action yes. Planning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just as kind of setting a little bit of the table. Mr. LaValle, you have something else to add? Yeah. Have we broken it to the task force that they might be tapped beyond May 11th? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, to clarify, May 11th is the last task force meeting. Yeah. So we we uh, we would not anticipate having any type of recommendations uh, finalized to the superintendent until probably closer to the end of May, end no, of I, the school year. Yeah, I'm just what I'm saying is is it sounds like those task force members might very well be needed beyond May 11th. Are they aware of that that they might be needed? Uh, yes, this just this last uh, meeting on Tuesday. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. That's okay. Yep. This yeah. last Tuesday, uh, Landon, broke the news Land, to him. yeah, Landon just <laughs> said, you know, that that could come out of it. It's not finite or or a definitive yet, but that could very well come out of that. So I, more to come. But well, yes. tell them I appreciate their work. That, absolutely. absolutely, yep. It's an exciting group. It's very robust and exciting. Yeah, I can tell that you're enjoying the conversations. Yeah, I, I am. Comments from the board. I'm seeing no, we again, like with strategic planning, look forward to the end product. Right. It's always the fun right. place to be. So thank you, Dr. Right. Peek, for your report. Right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, let's move on to um, item 9D, the strategic planning update, Mr. Gregory. Yeah, this would be Dr. Smith. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. So I am pleased to give this month's uh, strategic planning update and I uh, also just want to say thank you for your patience and your ongoing support of this effort as it has been going on for quite some time. As I've been sharing with stakeholder groups over the last week or so, two weeks, um, it's been in going on for about a year and a half with that hiatus that we took in the middle. So um, just wanted to point that out and again say thank you. Next slide, please. Now this slide you've seen a few times and I'm not going to belabor it too much, but I think it's important to look at milestones of where we've been 
starting with uh, forming our larger committee, the advisory committee, and then from there, the smaller think tank that is has been working um, uh, over the last two months, uh, quite a lot uh, with lately giving more opportunity for us to get stakeholder feedback. And we'll talk about that more uh, in this meeting. Just a reminder too that we did that full comprehensive data review and from that came our current state of the district report with an epilogue that we added about COVID to make sure that we reflected the fact that there was a pandemic in the middle of this work. And also that we had the open space forum where we had folks who volunteered time on that evening just to come and share their perspectives of what we had, uh, where we were as a district and what we um, could do better and what we're doing uh, particularly well. And then with the DEI work, we wanted to make sure and, and show that we were listening to that work and having clear intersections with um, that that uh, early work. And I think moving forward, you'll see that there'll be even more kind of commingling, working together with that group as well. And then finally, values identified and mission clarified, and that's what we'll talk most about this evening. Next slide, please. So we've been engaged in a virtual listening tour, and uh, as kind of as, as Dr. Peak was sharing. Going virtual, while I really love being in front of people and having the give and take of those kind of meetings, vir going virtual has allowed more groups, I think, to engage without those obstacles of coming to the EAC or um, you know, having to, to give up time otherwise than being virtually. So it has been valuable in some ways. But uh, so we have done the monthly stakeholder groups, including the AEA, Academy Education Association, um, providing a process and progress of where we are, but also getting feedback from these groups. The Superintendent's uh, Student Advisory Council, the Parent Sounding Board, Teacher Communication Council, and District Accountability Committee. And at this point, we're at about 150 folks that we've talked to through there. And the next slide, please. Can I, can I interrupt for a minute? Do you yeah. mind if we kind of interrupt as we go? Absolutely. If anybody please. would like to do that, feel free. I just don't want to lose the question. So those groups that you just talked about presenting to, you talked about process, right? You talked about process. Is that similar to what the board's been hearing each night? It's exactly the same presentation with some modifications just around the specifics around the mission and the values, but absolutely. Okay. And Thank part you. of that too is then providing a survey link where we ask uh, participants to give us feedback specific and I'll share with you those questions that we've asked. All them. right. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Or Dr. Smith. I'm way ahead of you. Sorry. No worries. So just last night we did a town hall meeting with uh, all licensed staff and had roughly 50 attendees that went particularly well until the very end, but we scrambled and part of the, um, you know, sometimes in challenges comes opportunity and uh, from there we, since we uh, couldn't get the link into the Microsoft Teams live format, uh, we then sent it out to all licensed staff and that's around 1730 uh, staff members who received both the recorded presentation that Allison and I provided as well as the, the survey link and so we're collecting that data now and uh, we'll be analyzing sharing that out at our next meeting at our next board meeting. Next slide please. So here are the questions from the survey tool and I would like for you to think about the survey tool also as the framework for how we'll share out the findings for, for the next board meeting. We asked these questions and asked all of the groups to respond. And after hearing the proposed mission and values, what immediately comes to mind? What words or section or phrases are most are you most drawn to? Does anything make you uneasy or uncomfortable? What needs to be in place or what does the district need to do to fully embrace these statements? How do you see your role reflected in these statements? What advice do you have for us as we move forward? And on a scale of one to five, one being the worst and five being the best, I think there was a little bit better language there, but how would you rate these updated statements? So like I said, we'll share out uh, the findings from all the different groups um, at our next board meeting using that as the framework, the survey tool. Next slide, please. So to give a little bit of a teaser um, before we do share out all the data and who knows, the 4.5 could go up or could go down just depending on how many folks uh, provide us data and what their thoughts are around it. But so far it's been very positive at a 4.5 out of 5. To give some... Yes, go ahead. If I may, yeah, please. Uh, so my question about this one. So this is, I guess I'll say the new mission and vision statements. Uh, how? how how complete is that? I mean, if you're grading it, it must be pretty complete because we haven't just on the record. None of us have seen that. Right. So yep. it says it's kind of our final draft, but we're taking feedback and, and definitely want to hear from all stakeholder groups, including the board, which is what we share at our next board meeting. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about it? And using those questions of 
basically what's working well for you and what's not working well. And is there something that we should be considering differently at this point? Yeah, so here are some, some sample, some high level thoughts that we're getting from our stakeholder groups currently around 150. I think I forgot to share with you that we're also meeting with um, a couple of groups of students at Air Academy High School and marketing class who are studying um, mission statements. So I'm excited to do that coming up very soon and getting their, their feedback as well. So, so far, respondents have said they are inspired and proud of the statements. They can see themselves and their work in the statements, and they appreciate that the statements are direct, clear, and con concise. The majority of suggestions and changes being noted thus far, or you know, those uneasy or questioning, um, ensuring all staff understand our mission and values and are communicated to, making sure that everybody knows what we're talking about, we're all on the same page. Integrating the statements into all areas of work at all levels of the organization and that there will be accountability measures. And just so you know, part of the presentation that we're giving is we're sharing our value statements and the value statements will have aspirational statements as well. And those aspirational statements help to kind of give a bit more meaning to those value statements, but it also is a bit of an accountability statement of this is what the behaviors that we're expecting when we're talking about these values. And that's what they're speaking to, I believe. And pushing toward alignment between all schools and the district. That we're all on the same page. Respondents have been incredibly forthright and candid about what they uh, want to stand for in the district and what this district is hopefully headed for into the future, and that has been exciting to see. Next slide, please. So again, you've seen this timeline before, but I just wanted to point out where we are. We're at that stakeholder review phase in April towards the end, and so we are making great progress towards our goal of beginning the integration in late May, early June. In fact, uh, next slide, please. The vision framework, which is what we're talking about, the mission and the vision, will drive conversations about goal setting um, and the focus uh, for the coming year at the June cabinet retreat. And we plan to have members of the CEI as well as our strategic planning consultants who you've met before to help model and facilitate the process of how to goal set using a vision framework. And particular attention will be given to identifying those intersections with DEI. And again, just wanting to make sure that we're not running parallel systems here, but these two plans are, um, are working in tandem, working together, working in partnership. And next slide, please. All right, that's it. What questions do you have for me? Mr. Lavelli. Just a quick comment. I've said this before. My hope is that it is concise slash short and measurable. Yeah, definitely it will be concise. And that's one of the uh, feedback that we're receiving is the excitement around having a, a concise, memorable mission statement and value statements that clearly align with it and also speak to who we are as a district and who we aspire to be. Mm -hmm. um, the measurable parts will come in when we're setting the goals tied to the vision framework, but um, absolutely. I don't think Mr. Gregory will allow us to have any goals other than those that are measurable, so. Thank you. Other board members? Sorry, Mr. Gregory, I'll get you. Mrs. Connors. Oh, I just wanted to say, I just appreciate the work. I think there's, you know, anybody who's gone into any of these committees knows that um, you don't want it to just kind of be another meeting to have a meeting. And so I also feel strongly, and it was one of the conversations that I had with, um, our interview, now I'm going to forget his name. No, HR. Cameron. Oh, Cameron, yes, thank you. Um, with him, is just not, as we have so many, especially like tonight, we saw how many new administrators we have. I just don't want anything to fall through the cracks. So um, I can appreciate there's consistency on the, on the committees, but um, that's something that um, I appreciate about the hard work that you guys are doing. So I, anyway, just appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gervie, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, just, uh, just a thought. Uh, I, I, maybe it's transparency or providing more information uh, because I get the sense that it feels like maybe some folks feel like they're in the dark on some things or there's like a punchline coming at the end of this whole process um, that, that maybe uh, Dr. Smith, and we haven't had this conversation yet, but uh, the board participate in the exact same process that everybody else has same presentation uh so they get to they get to feel what everybody else has felt same questions 
see the same things. I think that would be a, a positive exercise uh, for the board in many ways, but then also from the input side. Uh, yeah, that way that's really been a, a pretty pretty much all inclusive process at that yeah. point. Yeah, totally. The, the goal is that next board meeting will do that same kind of process, collect feedback through the, I don't know if it'll be the survey or just more anecdotal and sharing your thoughts directly at that point. It probably makes more sense. Uh, and then recording it in that way. But then also, um, you know, uh, sharing more of the experience uh, from the group and also giving kind of a data breakdown of all the data that we've collected. I mean, we're going to have a lot of data points from all of our stakeholder groups after seeing the same presentation that you'll see in the May 6th board meeting. So you get to hear from Dr. Smith three times in a row. Today, this meeting, May 6th, and then also the second meeting in May. If you'd like one after, I think actually I'm on the agenda for the one after. We'll just be hanging out with you at graduation. That's enough. <laughs> That's, that is coming up five weeks away, by the way. Graduation. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, my goodness. Other thoughts or comments for Dr. Smith? I have to agree that I, you know, it, I, the the input of stakeholders is huge, um, all stakeholders, and so uh, thank you for the effort to get to to most of them. Any other comments or questions? All right, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank, thank you. you for your work. All right, let's go to agenda item nine E. And by the way, board members are interested. There are six people still watching this live. If at any point anyone needs a break, you could tell me and we could take a break. I know we haven't done that much, but we are into two hours now and we've been here since 445. So if anyone feels the need to take five, just let me know. No, but no, but there's a comment here. When I was president and I went that long, I got killed. I know because, but I have a nice board. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I brought it up. I thought somebody might be remembering these things. All right, we're going to move on to agenda item 9E, and that is resolution 23421, approval of purchase over $1 million for district replenishment of devices and the one to one district provided device program for fiscal year 2122. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion, please. Ms. Allen. Thank you. One of four. One of First of four. Yes. First of all, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay, thank you. Good evening. Starting in the fall of 21, District 20 will launch the one-to-one -one district provided device program where each third through 12th grade student will receive a laptop regardless of their mode of learning, whether it's in-person, hybrid, synchronous, or remote. And students participate in this program for a user fee of $25 per semester. In February of this year, an RFP was published for a district-wide computer and technology contract because this year is our final contract year with Dell. Proposals were received from multiple vendors and Dell was unanimously selected. A contract was drafted for one base year, which is next fiscal year, and for four additional option years. Starting this school year, replenishment dollars have been managed at the district level to provide equity in devices, consistent pricing, and centralized purchasing. Since all district replenishment purchases now occur at the district level, the annual purchase amount exceeds $1 million and therefore requires board approval. In the resolution being considered this evening, IT is requesting purchase authority for next fiscal year in a not to exceed amount of $4 million to purchase student and staff devices for both replenishment and the one-to-one -one program. Back on August 6th of this year, the board approved a similar resolution in the amount of $2.5 million for Dell purchases in this current fiscal year. As a result of excessive lead times with Dell, especially because of the demand of devices due to the pandemic, this resolution is being presented for your consideration now so that orders can quickly be placed once we start the new fiscal year as needed. Do you have any questions for me or Ms. Kuzer? Mrs. Cloninger. This has nothing to do with that except for the IT piece, and that was something that um, 
Mr. Gregory brought up, and that was that Liberty Group. Those two that were um, thanked for being so amazing. I had the opportunity to work with them and just really appreciate it, that husband wife team. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you because I know that it's a, a collective village. Yeah. Mr. Lindbergh and then Mr. LaValle. A real easy question. I hope so. No, this is. Okay. How do you physically store this many computers? Well, I, I'm going to say my answer and then Ms. Kuzer, I look up because I know her voice will come out soon. But um, part of part of the plan, um, it, it is uh, quite a big task. A lot of it gets stored on the third floor here at the EAC okay. where the safety and security area is. And then it's an all hands on deck to get those deployed out to the buildings. Ms. Kuzer, would yes. you like to add anything? Yes, thank you, Ms. Allen. The, uh, the deployment certainly is a, a heavy lift. And if you recall this last year with the $4 million of CARES funding, we received over 11,000 devices. We staged it so that when we had semi-trucks deliver, which were, there were 12 deliveries on semi-trucks, um, that we would work with the warehouse very closely. So thank you, Becky, and your group, because they were able to distribute them to schools and get them in the hands of the techs who set them up. So. We, in a three month period, have worked through those 11,000 computers to get them all set up. So that was from the October to the January timeframe. So certainly everybody is involved in that process. Thank you. That's a great question, actually. I wondered the same thing. I wondered whose basement they were going in. But Well, when we went to do that um, linkage with our students, that DEI linkage, they were down the middles of a lot of those libraries, which is why I was saying I, I met with that Liberty group, but. Indeed. And Ms. Kuzer, do you remember the time that the elevator was being serviced and you yes. and your team had to get all those steps up and down the steps of the third floor? We called that our wellness. Um, that was the wellness, <laughs> they, yeah. That's right. <laughs> we got Mr. our steps. Lavelli, sorry, I think we cut you off there. No, thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, just a couple of questions, and this is probably generic to, to this and the next one, so feel free to, to answer, you know, it's for the next one too. So this buy is on top of the COVID relief money that we got, right? And so this is, this is puts a, a laptop and, and every kid in the district, I think above third grade. Um, the feds approved, I think that I, I, I could lose track of, of all the money the federal government's been spending. I think it was the 1.9 trillion, a bunch of money went to schools. Is it possible that we can take some of that Fed money and use it for this purchase that we won't have to spend this all this money? Sure. So just as a reminder, the money that you're referring to, those were the CRF, the Coronavirus Relief Fund. That's where we spent about $4 million on laptops. So for these purchases, what we're looking at is ESSER 3. So for ESSER 2, um, that was our second round after ESSER 1. So we had one, then two, and ESSER 1 and 2 are spoken for. But ESSER 3, as we start to look at that allocation that we're receiving, um, District 20 got over $8 million after distributions to the charter schools we'll have in the sevens. And this, uh, you know, device purchases in the hands of students, especially as a result of the pandemic, because we have multiple learning venues, students learning at home, that is absolutely a, an allowable expense um, associated with the ESSER three dollars. So as we look at all of the needs of the district, certainly technology is on the list as something that uh, is being considered. And with that, um, this is still an allowable period, so we can actually reimburse ourselves if that were approved by CDE, and we can go ahead and, and it can go back and reimburse some of these costs. I doubt it will be all of it because, again, um, we have other needs as well, but we are hopeful that it can support these costs to the extent possible. Good. So this is not, if you will, we're not. We hopefully won't have to spend all of this money out of our out of our budget. So that yeah, that's great. That is the hope. Um, assuming that we and I'm, I'm not, I should say assuming when we go back full time in the fall, um, normal operations. Is there a requirement? or even an encouragement for schools or teachers to use these laptops in the, in the classrooms. I mean, I, I, you know, I know that we had certain schools that were 100% um, device, one device per child, but, but, but just a couple of them. Are, are we, as a, as a district, are we transitioning to this computerized platform now? I, I'm not, 
I'm not a big, I shouldn't say this, but I'm not a big fan of a lot of screen time with kids. I tend to like a real teacher teaching things as opposed to screens. I mean, there is a place for them, don't get me wrong, but I'm just wondering, has our philosophy at all changed in our district? Mrs. Kuzer, would you like to take that one? Yes, I certainly can. Thank so you. when you talk about requirement, there's really no requirement, um, but it definitely is encouraged because our staff has spent so much time um, going through professional learning. They have really kind of retooled their tool bag. And so, you know, although COVID has had some real negatives, we have accelerated in the way that we have used these devices to really increase the collaboration with students um, like never before. And so with that learning, teachers won't be able to unlearn that. And I don't think we want them to. So it's going to be an encouragement. And I think that we, we always really rely and we trust our professionals who are teaching those students. And really it's around, they pick the right tool for the right task. So um, it's really, you know, a lot too around passive screen time versus active screen time. And I have to say, we had a lot of conversation with principals at the elementary level in the January timeframe of 2020. And that's when we came up with the K, you know, K through two had a three to one because they didn't feel that they wanted those youngsters at that level to have a one to one device. However, they really felt that around the equity of having each student have access to a device when they needed it had to be at that third through 12th grade uh, level. So I hope that helps answer the question. Thank you. Mrs. Conninger. Um, to that thought process, I, I um, Tom, I feel like uh, having kids in the district using those, uh, anybody who's been in an elementary uh, especially around testing and things, those were used heavily, you know, during that because they're lo preloaded onto those um, computers. Um, but, and it's always a scramble, you know, to get everybody in front of one when it's, um, I mean, they're, especially, I'm thinking elementary. Um, so I, I realize that the screen time is an issue and, and I appreciate what um, Ms. Kuzer just said about the active versus you know, inactive, because that's a real big thing. But I think that that's something that we can take away from this is, you know, the benefits that we get um, in that technology, in useful technology, the the things that we've seen these kids be able to do with, um, you know, just like even with the um, uh, Challenger space, you know, being able to do things online. Uh, certainly most of us have read to kids and things like that online. It's been really helpful. So there's, there's definite perks to it, I think, um, and hopefully, you know, pardon? Yeah, for sure, pros and cons. So I just appreciate that it's been there. I was going to ask too, was the, um, in the ESSER 3, was that also hotspots included in that? We put some of the um, hotspot dollars for the next year and the following year into ESSER 2. Okay. So, um, you know, Mrs. Kuzer and I will collaborate to see if she sees that as a necessity uh, for the following year as well. I know when I read this, I, I went right to access and and I agree with Mr. Lavalley. You know, there's nothing really better than a teacher in front of a student teaching. But the access piece was addressed here that I feel like we were that we're hurting across the state with, but we were addressing here in the district is that making sure that every student has access to the same resources um, as every other student. Um, and then again, I, I'll go back to Mrs. Kuzer's point that we trust our professionals, but I agree. After teaching online for a few months now, I like to get in front of my students again, and I get it. It's, it's a difficult time, but Mr. Gregory, do you yeah, have something? I, I was just going to say. I think it's probably important to say that it's in, in no way is the intent to replace the teacher with a computer mm -hmm. uh, that and Ms. Reynolds kind of said that, that it's, you know, it's another tool. Uh, it's another, um, you know, frankly, for those students who might be going on to uh, college uh, at some point, um, you, my kids who are both in college now, uh, everything is, uh, even in class, in person instruction, uh, everything is accessed through uh, a platform, or whatever school is used, whether it's Canvas or Schoology or whatever those might be. That's still where um, 
you know, the syllabus and assignments and videos and all that stuff is there and how you uh, most students uh, at least would uh, turn in assignments. So, you know, even outside of just the device, the, the technology itself, it's it's still in preparation for um, you know, something that they will be doing. And I imagine it's more than just college. Um, you know, it's it's all over the place, but it's not intended to. Uh, I think I just want people to know that it's it, it, we're in a semi online environment. The, the idea isn't that we maintain an online environment into the future um, to where the, the device becomes the teacher uh, or similar to that. It's it's still going to be the teacher in the classroom in an in person environment um, where it's just a, a tool, a supplemental tool. You know, I I just share an anecdote. Um, uh, I'm an airline pilot and, and we used to have platform instructors teach us the systems of the airplane. And back in the old days, 727, you know, we, we used to joke about you literally build the airplane, but you knew the airplane really well because you had those instructors in front of you teaching. And, and now it's literally all the systems are done online. And and I'm not saying we're unsafe because we're not, um, but but we don't know the airplane nearly as well. Um, part of that's automation. It, it, it has worked out that we don't need to know as much because things are so much more automated. But we, we remark that that what you learn sitting in front of a computer screen just from our perspective is it's just not nearly as good as that that interaction face to face. So that's all. Absolutely. Oh, you know, I've saved a lot of paper since COVID started. <laughs> all right. Uh, any other discussion before we have a roll call, please? OK, roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Lundberg. Aye. Mrs. Reynolds. Aye. All right. Thank you, board. Um, item F, resolution 23521, approval of purchase over $2.5 million for district devices fiscal year 2021. Need a motion, please. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Gregory, Ms. Sellen. What I want to point out before I just give a brief overview is the resolution we just looked at is for next fiscal year. The one that I'm going to talk about now is for this fiscal year. So as I mentioned a few moments ago, back on August 6th, the board approved a resolution giving spending authority to IT for Dell purchases in an amount not to, to exceed $2.5 million. At this point in the fiscal year, about $2.3 million have either been expended or spoken for, encumbered, if you will, for Dell devices. Of this amount of the 2.3 million, about 1.6 million is for laptops for third through fifth grade students at Mountain View Elementary and all students at Challenger and Pine Creek High School. These schools are the SILT schools and they have been using iPads in the past. And these schools in collaboration with IT have decided to transition away from the Apple iPads to laptops at the beginning of next year. And this was not known this year. So when this amount of $2.5 million was requested back in August 6th, we didn't know that it really wouldn't be adequate to also address the needs of the SILT school transition as well. And IT still has about $2.2 million of staff and student laptops and cases uh, this year to purchase. Again, but because of that unanticipated purchase for the SILT schools, this $2.2 million would put us over the $2.5 million amount that the board approved back in August. So IT staff are asking uh, in this resolution to go ahead and extend their purchase authority from $2.5 million this year to $5 million. And that is what you have before you this evening. Any questions for myself or Ms. Couser? Mr. Lumbert. What will we do with the iPads? Um, Ms. Couser, did you want to address that? The lease and the... Yeah, most of them are leased. The lease and the actual iPads? So we have, uh, if you recall, the plan working with the elementary schools was to equip elementary students K through uh, second grade with a iPad at three to one ratio. So three students to one iPad. So we will, this is gonna actually help fill those gaps. So we don't have to purchase any iPads right now. That buys us, you know, that two year time frame in which we can leverage those iPads at the elementary level. 
Mrs. Conninger, oh, that was your question as well. Anybody else have questions for Becky or Ms. Guzman? Okay, so roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. All right, agenda item G, 9G, monthly re financial report through March 2021. Mr. Gregory, Mrs. Allen? Three of four. Three of four. What you have in front of you is the monthly financial report through the end of March, and if you can believe it, this marks the conclusion of the third quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, as you know, I have a PowerPoint that will go ahead and run in tandem with the uh, items that I reference here in, in my remarks. So next slide, please. If you would please uh, refer to table one on PDF page four. It's also again shown on the PowerPoint. I did a some, little something different this time. I put some colored boxes around some of the numbers, so I'll mention that as I go through. Uh, looking at letter A. She used the colors for you, Mr. Lumber. I, I sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Becky. <laughs> looking at letter A, though, we have letter A as well. Uh, in the blue box, you can see that we've collected about 58% of our revenue, which is about 1.6 percentage points higher than last time at this year, which is shown in the green box. Uh, this is also shown, next slide please, on graph number one on PDF page six along with the dollar amounts at the bottom of the page uh, that comprise the difference between this year and last. And again, you could do next slide, please. Thank you, that's graph number one that shows that difference in revenue and, and it's broken down at the bottom. And so you can go down to next slide again, please. Thank you. Back to table number one on PDF page four, looking at letter B in the blue box. Expenditures are at about 70% of budget as compared to almost 77% this time last year in the green box. This lower rate is mainly due to last year's shift in the cal salary calendar that accelerated the rate of expenditures. Next slide, please. Looking at PDF page 10, you will see graph five, which compares resources to expenditures. Resources are exceeding expenditures by about 43.9 million shown as the gap on the PowerPoint slide. Again, the bullet points below the graph highlight what makes up that difference. Next slide, please. Since this is a quarterly report, you will see table two on PDF page five. It shows financial information for each fund. As of the end of March, all funds have year-to-date actuals in excess of expenditures, with the exception of the Designated Purpose Grants Fund, which I put some blue circles around. This is common because with many of our grants, we often get reimbursed after we spend the money. Finally, if you please turn to PDF page three, Next slide, please. Thank you. You will see a chart with projected fund balance information for this current fiscal year. On the top half of the slide, you will see the projected fund balance data chart from the last quarterly report that was of the, as of the end of December. The bottom half shows the data chart as of March 31st. This is a little bit of a new approach for me for sharing this information. So I'm just gonna spend a, a little bit more of a moment explaining it and I would love feedback if you think it's not, not a helpful approach. We are going to focus on the unassigned column. And if you recall earlier this year, I shared some information regarding this fund balance chart. Unassigned fund balance is similar to money that you would save in your family bank account but it's really not planned for any purchase. It's there in case you need it, but you're not sure what you might need it for. The column to the right is called restricted or assigned because it's fund balance for a specific purpose like Tabor as an example. As an analogy, these dollars are similar to money that you would put away for your child's college education. It has a specific purpose tied to it. In the pink boxes, both on the top chart and the bottom, you see 34.6, it's in the top row of each one of the charts, $34.6 million as the beginning audited unassigned fund balance for this fiscal year. In the March chart on the bottom slide, 
you'll see a number in black, which is just beneath that. That represents the most current projection for where total revenue for this fiscal year will wind up. Remember, we budget those expenditures and our revenue projections at the beginning of the fiscal year in our adopted budget and at the mid-year. But as we progress through the year, sometimes things aren't exactly as we've put in those budgets. So this is Kathy Watts, wonderful director in budget and finance, who looks at kind of what is happening and adjusts some numbers. And this guess is showing about $1.5 million more in revenue than what was shown in December. The number in the red box below represents best estimate for total expenditures and that shows a little bit higher expenditures than what was predicted in December by about $800,000. Finally, in the December chart, the top one, you'll notice two numbers in orange, right around 3.4 million. They correspond to Tabor. The December chart shows that we reduced the Tabor fund balance by 3.4 million and moved it to the unassigned. We did that in our adopted budget because we had so many budget cuts. But remember at the mid-year, we plugged that hole up. So if you look at the bottom chart for March, you don't see that. But you see that the unassigned fund balance went down by 3.4 million because it had to scoot back over to the restricted column being in Tabor. On the left portion of the slide, you see sort of a running tab of the changes from December to March and it's a net decrease of about $2.7 million from our estimate back in December. And again, the largest chunk of that is the Tabor that moved from unassigned over to restricted. And so if you do those comparisons, the $4.3 million is the consumption of unassigned fund, fund balance the end of December. If we use up another 2.7, which is very heavily the Tabor piece, we end up with our best projection at this exact moment in time that will use about $7.1 million of unassigned fund balance this year. Please know this is only a projection and we will not know the exact amount until we have our audited balances way out in November. Do you have any questions for me? Mr. Lavalle. Thank you, uh, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, um, Ms. Allen. This is more of a comment to our listening audience, to, to teacher staff. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, what this means is we're having to pull out a savings seven. We estimate that this current fiscal year we will have to pull out a savings seven million dollars to be flush. Is that correct? Yes. Right now, the projection is that level of consumption. Yeah. Now, whether we'll get there, you know, again, we have a very conservative budgeting approach. So, um, you know, as we budget full amounts for salaries and all of those pieces, there are variables that occur and we may not spend as much as, as anticipated, sure. but the most conservative view puts us about there. And what we, what you haven't heard is us saying we're going to have to cut salaries and that's not on the, that's not on the table. Uh, I just want people to understand that, that this is not a good number. We knew this was coming. We expected this, but we also value our employees and we're doing everything we can to keep their salaries where they they ought to be so i just i just want everybody to understand that 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 this is a, a big hit but we are still doing everything we can to keep those salaries where they need to be yes so thank great you. comments Mr. Thank you. yeah it does speak to our priority other comments or questions for mrs allen another nice thank job you. mrs allen thank you i just turned my mic off we're going to move on to um H, the preliminary revenue assumptions for fiscal year 21-22. Mr. Gregory, Mrs. Allen. Ms. Allen. All right. So as we near the close of the 2021 fiscal year, we are, of course, heavily preparing for the 21-22 budget. And before we get into some of the details, I'm just going to provide a big picture overview of what is ahead uh, for the rest of this fiscal year in terms of the Board of Education. And this really aligns with state statute. So preliminary budget assumptions are presented. That's this evening. The proposed budget will be presented to the board on May 20th. 
that's the second board meeting in May to comply with state statute because the proposed budget needs to be submitted to the board at least 30 days prior to the fiscal year. But 30 days wouldn't be enough because within 10 days of May 20th to comply with state statute, we put a public notice in the newspaper just informing the public that the proposed budget is available for review. Then June 3rd, we will go ahead and have a budget hearing. And finally, June 17th is the date that we will plan to adopt the budget. And again, that satisfies the statutory deadline of having an adopted budget by June 30th to be ready July 1st, that new fiscal year with an adopted budget. So can now, I interrupt for a second? Given what Mrs. Thompson told us earlier about the the June 1st closure yes. of the legislative work, how how's it going to fit? Yep, that's I a mean, great question. So what that means is this, we're behind about a month. So they are about, they, thank you so much. Yes, I like that. I'm right on top of it. That was um, a little rhetorical on my part, but go ahead. <laughs> all right. Um, so it's uncertain as to exactly when we would have uh, the Joint Budget Committee finalized the 21-22 Long Bill and therefore the School Finance Act. So what could happen? It is quite possible that the process at the state level will not conclude until 2021 uh, of June. So where does that put us? Our timeline is really fixed. I will be coming to you on May 20th. And this means that I, when I present that adopted budget, and I'll go into more detail in a moment, it's possible that the Long Bill and School Finance Act may, both may not be finalized at that point. So what would happen big picture if there are significant differences that I would come back and share those with you in June? Very similar to what we had last year. Now, here's what we do have right now. The most current amended budget request for 21-22 is from January 21 of this year. In this request, the budget stabilization factor is reduced, which is a good thing, and the per pupil revenue amount is higher, which is a good thing. As you know, during the board work sessions that we've done regarding revenue assumptions, I've always given you two scenarios. Scenario one was the full amount of the PPR that we're seeing from the January uh, amendment. And the second one is half of that amount. Now I made up the half of that amount. That's not an official type of forecast from the state. It was just something for us to really consider. Now we've all seen hurricane forecasts and snowstorm forecasts, right? And the further we out, we are out, the larger that cone of uncertainty for the hurricane, for the snowstorm, and weather forecasters look for signals. They run their models and all of that, and they start to say as the storm approaches, I'm feeling less and less and less confident about this and more and more confident about that. It's never certain, but they look for these signals to inform which scenario is the most plausible. Well, we are trying to do the same thing here. So we've been looking at different signals that we can digest that give us clues as to which one of these scenarios is most plausible. So we've had two big signals that we could look at. The first one is each quarter, the Joint Budget Committee at the state level, they receive some economic forecasts from Colorado Legislative Council and the Office of State Planning and Budgeting. And the most recent outlooks were from March, just a month ago. They were very favorable, mainly due to higher than anticipated personal tax collections and just economic conditions improving more than were forecast. Secondly, at the end of March, as Ms. Thompson shared, the 21-22 long bill was introduced, the state budget bill, and there's some figure setting involved. And when we did the math on that figure setting and really tried to, to walk, I literally did it with a paper, pencil, and calculator, I came within $2 of the per pupil revenue that we are seeing in the latest run from CDE from the January amounts. So as I look at the snowstorm approaching, I think it's easier to discard one possibility, the Albuquerque low, and instead look at, and so really the signals are pointing to 
while the per pupil revenue may not exactly match scenario one, what matches what was released in January, it certainly seems more plausible than scenario two, which was cutting it in half. So that is my recommendation for this evening and for us moving forward with building that assumed budget or the proposed budget based on these assumptions, because it certainly is the, the most plausible option out there as we look at that. Unless we saw dramatic changes within the next week to two weeks, that is what we'll proceed with. And again, if there are significant changes, then we will bring them to you in June. If there's changes that are not significant, then we would simply true up our numbers in the mid-year budget that we present in January. Does that help Ms. Reynolds on your question? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. So now I'm going to proceed to page three in the report and everything. I don't have PowerPoint because it's it's very it flows very nicely in the report and you can keep going down until it's going to be um, page three and that is three on the bottom of the page like the for real page number, not the PDF page number. So item number one is about total program funding. Just as an example, this is one of the items. There are three items in this report that involve uh, heavily rely on per pupil revenue. So for three, three items, you see two scenarios. Scenario one is the full budget amount increase that's shown with the PPR. And the second scenario is the half. And you'll see in the section that talks about scenario one at the very bottom of that bullet, that last bullet in that little section, it says this is the re recommended scenario. So what you can see is that the increase from our mid-year per pupil revenue, what was in that mid-year budget in January, is a little over $825, so an $826 increase. Now to give you um, just some context, that's a 10.9% increase over what we currently are living with in our mid-year budget. And when you think back, what we're living now is a 5% decrease from last year. So what this type, if it does come to fruition, not only would it make up the 5% cut that, that, that started with the pandemic, it really would put us back even further than that in a positive way to bring us uh, an increase even beyond going back to pre-pandemic levels. That doesn't erase the negative effect, the budget stabilization factor. It does. It's still there. It's still there, and I'll talk about Nothing in a moment. Erases that. <laughs> I'll talk about in a moment that that they're trying to basically put it back to what it was last year, or excuse me, this year, which is this year it doubled from last year. If this comes to fruition next year, we'd be back at about the 15.6 million to 16 million mark instead of what we're living right now, which is 32 million. So it would have some significant impacts. Item two talks about student enrollment. This does not have two scenarios because per pupil revenue is, is doesn't relate. Now, although head count is not called out in the report, funded pupil count is, I'm going to talk about head count first because selfishly for me, it makes a lot more sense as opposed to jumping in the funded pupil count. So the head count in 1920 last year prior to the pandemic was a little over 26,600. And you know this year we had a decline by almost 900 students. The headcount projection for next year is very similar to what we had last year, plus about 74 students. So if I were to draw it out, last year looks it's kind of like a V. Last year's enrollment up here, this year comes down. Next year our projection is that we go up and scoot a little bit more. So we would go back very close to 1920. Again, it's our best projection. It's an assumption. Um, we probably won't hit it exactly, but we do our best with a variety of data to try to make those decisions. In terms of funded pupil count, what does that mean? It equates to about 498.7 higher. Why I don't start with that number? Because it, it doesn't make sense quite as much. Remember, it goes back to that averaging piece. So the 900 is more like cut in half. And so that's that's that growth that you see, which is why I wanted to talk headcount to start with. Item three talks about the mill levy override. 
Um, as you know, we have that total 26,750,862 that uh, Mr. Gregory, despite being almost two years out of the CFO role, can, can get that number right out. Um, now, this amount cannot increase for next year or any year without voter approval. And of this amount, TCA gets about $2.18 million. New Summit will have about $640,000. So after charter allocations, the district uh, non-charters will get a, a little less than $24 million in mill levy uh, revenue. Now on to page four. Item four re, uh, addresses assessed valuation. And earlier in the board work session, we talked about uh, assessment years, uh, reassessment years. This year, we only saw an increase of 0.12% to our AV, prior year 15.9%. And we are moving into a reassessment year and are expecting uh, a forecasted growth by about 8.9%. And as we discussed, it, it could perhaps be higher. And because Gallagher was repealed in November, we can predict that uh, the assessment rate will be at 7.15%. Items five, six, and seven involve specific ownership taxes, categorical grants from the state, and federal Medicaid funding. And these uh, items all highlight some expected net revenue increases for next year's budget. Item eight addresses uh, pre-kindergarten uh, preschool tuition building rental and parking fees. Uh, this year, because of COVID, the preschool tuition was reduced, building rental revenue was significantly reduced, and parking fees, we simply did not charge them at all. So this line uh, reinstates these for next year to get back to the revenue levels that we would expect. Items nine and 10 still on this page address impact aid. And first, uh, part of impact aid revenue relates to a 20% threshold of military dependent students. And while this threshold was met for the current year, um, it is not because we were able to use the prior year's data. We get about $480,000 for that, and we want to be very conservative because there are times we have not qualified. So we would rather take that out and it's a nice, it's a very nice thing for us to experience if we receive that, that supplement, if you will, but we are at least taking a conservative approach and not automatically putting it in next year's revenue budget. Secondly, if you recall with respect to impact aid for this year's budget, typically $1.7 million of our impact, impact aid money each year goes directly to the technology fund. This year, we redirected it to the general fund, so the tech fund did not receive those dollars. So next year, in the budget that you will see for the proposed budget, I will be recommending that we, again, direct those $1.7 million to the technology fund, so we have to reduce the general fund revenue amount by that, because it's an expense, if you will, because it's going to technology. Staying within the district, just a different fund. Item 11 talks about that para on behalf payment. It looks really big. Whoa, we're getting $3.5 million. But we've talked about this one before. It's that on behalf payment where we're sort of the, the middle institution um, where we get those dollars and then we make that on behalf payment. And so while we're getting that revenue, it, we also have an equal expense of 3.5 million. This on behalf payment was suspended this year due to COVID. Our best guess is that it will happen again next year. That's why we're putting it back in the budget. Now on to page five, um, item 12 addresses property taxes. This year, we saw an increase in our property taxes of $2.2 .2 million. It was only due to the fact that less people, that money didn't come in last year like it should have because people had extensions on their property tax payments due to COVID. So we had extra money this year, but it's not recurring. It's just happening this one time because the timeline was different. So this is backing that out. Item 14, uh, new school finance act revenue. This is based on the PPR increase uh, that we are projecting. Uh, and the enrollment increase. So uh, it's about $25 million. 
and about 3.5 million of that will go to the charters. Item 15 talks about fund balance, and if you recall, the way we'll start our starting fund balance in our budget book for next year will be the mid-year, what we showed as those ending projections. We It, it goes mid-year to adopted budget to mid-year to adopted budget that sets those. And then as Mr. Gregory brought up, item 16, budget stabilization factor. Again, last fiscal year, we had a budget stabilization factor of about 16 million. It doubled this year to 32 million. If this all pans out next year, we'll be back about 15.6 million. So I never thought I'd say, whoo, 15.6 million is quite a savings, but it is in relationship to where we were this year. Before I take any questions you may have, I just want to take a moment to provide an update regarding staff salaries and benefits. With respect to health insurance, it has absolutely been a top priority for staff to not see any increases in their monthly premiums next year. And as you know, Kaiser, our overall costs for District 20 next year are up 7.5% for next year. That's the equivalent of $1.14 million. Again, top priority for our staff, uh, not only just because it's the right thing, but also especially the uncertainties of the pandemic. We don't wanna have an additional cost uh, for our staff. So we were able to share with staff at the beginning of April that uh, District 20 will be absorbing all of that cost. So while our premium costs will go up, a staff member will have the same premiums that they've experienced this year. Now, with respect to salaries, very similar to, to uh, what Mr. Lavalley shared a little bit ago, our projected revenue projections are promising. However, we are still in the planning stages. And so no final decisions have been made regarding the exact amount of salary increases for next year, but please rest assured, salary increases for staff also remain an important priority for us. Before I take any questions that you have, I would re be remiss if I did not also thank uh, another one of my great partners in the finance area, Brian Cortez. Uh, he's been working so hard on the budget and I appreciate all of his hard work and, and so much of his work is reflected in what I was able to share with you tonight. Do you have any questions for me? Mrs. Connors. Um, I appreciate your report. I also appreciate Brian, and I know that uh, he contributes as well as the rest of your team to um, a good report. Um, it's it's definitely hard to hear um, that things aren't set as far as the um, teacher salaries and things like that that we know are so important. And I and I feel like I need to say this um, for a lot of reasons that I appreciate that that is high on your list. It does not come across that way when we're in the middle of a pandemic or in um, issues with uh, things maybe out of our control with uh, you know higher costs of insurance and things like that. But um, I know from sitting with this board uh, many times that that is a priority and that this board supports anything that will help and um, and make teachers be in a better position. So I just wanted to say thank you for saying that. I know it's hard to kind of speculate what's going to be on the table when we don't know and there's so many variables. So I just want to say thank you for keeping that as a priority. Thank you, Mrs. Conager. Oh my goodness. Uh, oh, Mr. Gregory would like to say something. Just, you wanna mention, this is all general fund. I, I just think it might be good to mention Title I. Yes. Just as a heads up, possibly. Yeah, so Dr. Field um, and Jean Tay, Jean Tay supports the grant work. And uh, last week, um, Dr. Field learned that part of our Title I funding is going to decrease uh, almost $530,000 for next year. What happens is they look at uh, the at-risk students, uh, students of free reduced status, but they're in arrears. And next year is the year that we are going to go ahead and experience uh, that reduction. So here is our plan. 
We were just about ready with the ESSER 2 application to CDE, but we are revising it with Jean's excellent help and we're almost done with that and with Dr. Field's support. In our title schools, uh, positions, title dollars often go to fund people and materials. And when we look at about $526,000 cut, that is interventionist, that is MTSS coordinator, that is instructional paras in some of our title schools. Well, we know because of COVID, we have significant learning loss, and that is the purpose of some of these grant dollars that we are getting. And so I've talked with CDE, and what we are going to do is be is asking for, we rewrote some of the ESSER II grant basically to fund these positions next year. The logic being, Everything has to tie for COVID for ESSER 2. And what we've written in is the following, that these positions are so critical to supporting student intervention progress monitoring, and especially in light of the learning loss that's at, in play because of COVID, that it would be catastrophic to lose these positions at this point. So that is what we are sending to the state, hoping that they will lend their support. Initial conversations have been positive, but of course we want to wait for that application to be approved, but that is our plan at this point because the continuity and the continuation of these positions is critical. So, so essentially it's kind of weird. We're, we're using one color of federal money yes. to plug the hole of another color of federal yes. money. And depending how long that might be, we might try to use ESSER 3 a little bit to plug another year. We're still trying to gather that information. Yeah, I was just going to make the same comment about this is federal dollars being moved around. Um, good thinking. Do you, and then there's a hope that maybe Title I dollars will pick up again. I sure hope so. After we stop giving money out for COVID. Yes, and and you know, uh, we also are, have gone through a period here like this year, for example, where not as many applications have been submitted. You know, families sometimes think about the, the lunch benefit. Yeah. And remember, all feeding this year is free for our students. So there may not be, although we've encouraged, our applications are lower than normal. Mm -hmm. So we expect that it'll it'll hopefully get to a more steady level, but because the Title I dollars are in arrears, it takes a little bit to catch up. Indeed. Yeah, that's a good addition. Thank you. Yeah. Do you happen to know what that threshold is, Becky, or do we, is Dr. Field? Can you weigh in, Dr. Field, on I want to say it was a five, five or ten percent. No, Put her on the spot, but I just did. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. I'm here. Do you all need me to uh, answer a question? Just Susan, the the Title One threshold that we did not meet uh, that produced this half million dollar loss for next year. What is that threshold? Five percent poverty rate for children ages five through 17 living in our um, attendance boundaries. So we were less than 5%. Yes, uh, and remember it's two years in arrears. So this is from 2019. And that was the frustration that I shared with CDE is that, you know, they can see our next year's poverty rate, which is back above 5% and how such a drastic cut completely impacts programming for students and that really perhaps at like a three year trend would be a better way to fund um, Title I, but within the Title I funding there's four categories and when you slip below 5% five per you are only um, eligible for one which is the basic. When you think about the equality piece that we're trying to figure out too that certainly goes into the frustration of that because those are our kids that are most impacted by you know not having the ac accessibility so that's hard to hear it's ha it has happened to us in the past you know, four four five ish maybe yeah. longer than that years ago now and it was a one year i'll call it a one year mm -hmm. blip we recovered the next year but that year cde helped plug the hole mm -hmm. uh but to susan's point you know to run a when these when these dollars are funding positions, uh, important positions, yeah. you know, her argument is why do we use a one year snapshot to right. be bouncing in and out of this program at the tune of $500,000 difference? Mm -hmm. 
when maybe you used a three year rolling average or something like to smooth out those peaks. Yes, um, yes. but the deaf averaging ears. something. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And it's going to be a big effort next year to re engage people in self reporting, isn't it? Yes, uh, to keep those numbers up. Yes. Yes, Can I ask a fun. question to that? Um, so if we go down 5% as a district, that's one thing. Is there something else based on the individual schools as well? You know, like I know we've had schools that have gone in and out of title kind of requirement or be, you know, being called a title school. Yes, yeah, so Heather, we have criteria that we establish as a district. And what we look at is free and reduced lunch at about 30%. So, it, it, and we would never, like we have been slowly weaning Douglas Valley off being a Title I school for this next year will be our third year because the resources and the programming that are in place, um, they're, they're, you know, there's still needs. And so we are bringing in Prairie Hills because Prairie Hills passed Douglas Valley in their um, free and reduced lunch status percentage. So we are slowly weaning Doug Valley out and bringing Prairie Hills in. But 30% is our is our threshold. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Becky, I just have uh, a couple of questions. Yes, um, so on paragraph nine here, uh, you mentioned an FY 22, 21 and 22. Uh, it's, the budget is going to be reduced by 480. Uh, and then you speak to the, uh, the threshold of average daily attendance of military dependents. So the money that the district receives, is that static or does it fluctuate depending upon that meeting that threshold? So if it's 30%, do you get more or do you get a certain amount that comes in when you hit the threshold? It's zero or if you pass that mark. Okay. So you could be at 19%, you get zero. You do not get a reduced amount, a prorated amount. Yeah. And that's why we, I'm so cautious to put the whole uh, half a million dollars in there because yeah. Um, it, it, it's a it's a all or nothing. OK, and Colonel Johnson, I think and Becky, we don't have the numbers right off the top, but I know for like the last. Many five, six, maybe even as many as 10 years, we have been. Right around that 20%. I mean, yeah. like one year they they allowed us to round, which was good because we were at 19.5 uh, and they called it 20%. Um, so we're hovering right around that 20%. Uh, it seems like annually now. So from a projection standpoint, it's probably best to assume that it's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, although okay. it's really, really important. This is where the importance of folks submitting those, mm -hmm. what we yeah, call the certainly. impact aid forms, right. are so important because each one of those that we can show, we have a, you know, it's not just military. It's federally, uh, you know, federally connected students um, gets us closer or puts us over that 20 percent. Uh, thanks for that. That, that, that was going to be my second question when you mentioned here that uh, it's not certain that it will occur again. So the the going in planning assumption is that uh, we will not plan for it just based on the inconsistency yeah. that you're receiving the, the forms. Whatever. Exactly. So like this year in well and not just the forms, but what the count will be. OK, so this year at the mid year when we presented the updated budget, we had a revenue increase of four hundred and eighty thousand for this year because we knew we had it. Okay. And so we would have to make that same adjustment. We'd be happy to make that's a great adjustment to make, but we'd rather make that one of adding it in at the mid year rather than pulling it out. OK, all right, thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Great question, Colonel Johnson. I had the same, but you said it better than I would have. Uh, Mr. LaValle. I, I'm just thinking out loud. I, I suspect the raw number of military families is probably about constant because I, I don't really know. That's Fort right. Carson maybe is growing, but and, and our district is growing, so I suspect that percentage is going to be harder to reach every day. That's right. It starts to uh, dilute it because the larger population stays the same whereas about the military population is more static, so then it gets diluted the bigger the larger group is. Thank you, Mrs. Helen. Any other comments or questions? Becky, I loved your report. I thought it was done very well. It was easy to read and understand, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your work tonight.
you were busy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Field, too. You're welcome. It's easier when those cabinet members are sitting here too, isn't it? We can just look yeah. at each other. But and like I yes, said, I keep you. thinking they're above the ceiling. Well, you guys all, she keeps looking heavenward for all I of the regis. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I uh, am right upstairs. I, 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 me and Maureen are right above the board room. There you you can just like knock on the ceiling. There you go, there you go. Agenda item 10A is a uh, board development's building fund update. And I would like to invite the executive director for the building fund to the podium, Mr. Henry Wright Wiesner. Is my microphone on? Yep. Great. Thanks. Good evening, board. Henry Ryan Reisner. Um, yeah, the first slide. Great. Oh, I need my glasses. All these devices. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, you've seen this issuance 2A and issuance 3 summary. I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's kind of a roadmap of where we've been. Um, everything's going very well. We just finished spring break, so there was a chance to get into schools. Um, um, there's data we've spoken about the last few months on what this represents. Next time I present, there'll be more significant pictures, but um, it, it's more of a, a graphic um, familiarization of where we've been. Let's go to the next slide and talk about facility audit. As we know, facility audit uh, are doors and windows and some masonry. So next slide. Over spring break, there was lots of work done for um, thermal protection and, um, and tuck pointing, um, caulking, various different um, brick buildings, uh, repair control joints. Uh, next slide, please. A uh, life safety as well, because it's a, a door that was accident. Uh, here's a picture of Edith Wolford uh, exterior windows that have been replaced over spring break. Um, operable windows, so it's again thermal comfort and moisture protection. Next slide. And uh, operable windows at uh, Timberview Middle School were completed over spring break. Next slide. Here is the atrium just outside of our room uh, looking up and from the outside a uh, uh, leak that was discovered and uh, repaired. So again, thermal protection and uh, trying to protect our assets. Um, the slide on the right shows the completion of the fire alarm system at the facilities complex. Um, so that's more of life safety and risk management. So checking off a lot of those components. Next slide, please. For Encompass Heights Elementary School, um, we are still remain on budget and on schedule. I look forward to getting you on a ribbon cutting event and a tour and showing all the wonderful progress. But um, before I show you the next few slides, I did have a chance to visit the elementary school 28 up in St. Brain Valley School District. That's the sister school that we uh, borrowed the floor plan from from the same, from the same architect. Uh, and they're progressing and they'll be open up at the same time we are. So uh, um, exciting times. Um, yeah, let's move into the next slide. Here's an aerial image. So you're standing at the intersection from the south looking to the northeast and the oval to the left you see is the bus loop. Uh, this is from two weeks ago, the racetrack here. Yeah. No, it's not a racetrack. It's six safe buses get to drop off and pick up students there. Um, but you're looking at the front door um, and you can see the uh, construction traffic parking. Uh, next slide, please. Here you're looking at from the other side. So now you're looking due south. Um, the what's relevant on this image in the upper left hand corner, you can see the fence along our south property line and you can just see a little bit up our east property line, establishing our boundaries of making sure that we're being respectful to our neighbors. And also you can see just barely where we're cutting in some driveways. So there's an entrance and then there's an exit aligning with those neighborhood streets. So you'll see pictures from the other side in just a moment. But everything's progressing very well. The roof is complete. We're dried in. Next slide. Here you're looking at the service yard. Uh, our utilities have been all put in and we're on permanent electrical power now. Um, you can see the um, electrical switch gear, uh, the green box in the front there is the gen uh, transformer, the blue box in the service yard is the uh, uh, generator, 
and there's sanitary sewer connections. You can see some pipes. You're seeing the kitchen in the small area to the right, cafeteria right behind it with the blue wall and have some paneling there, the gymnasium on the left side, um, but it's progressing again, like I said, very well. Um, let's see what else is relevant. The service area also drops off and picks up from the kitchen area and the grease trap, natural gas. Um, next slide, please. Here you're looking at the classroom side. So we're finishing up, we have finished the brick on the north side. Um, again, this is from a few weeks ago. So the scaffolding is removed and the masonry is complete. You can see the other pictures. And then the upper left hand corner, you can see in the background, that's the art room and the art room has a door that opens up, so a, a connection. Um, the lower right hand side, the entrance. So you'll see um, that image in just a moment. We'll walk in that door and you'll be able to see what it is when you walk in that door. Think of um, Legacy Peak Elementary School, walking in the door and the office is on the left, library is on the right. Next slide. Um, so here's where I mentioned earlier. Um, you, we're now at the street looking at that exit driveway. So we've cut out the concrete curb and this is the exit out. So connecting in with the new road now. Um, all the concrete curb and gutter, stormwater management controls are in place. So those are all been poured and ready to take on asphalt once the dry weather comes back. So uh, we're, we're dealing with a little bit of details there, but nothing to prevent us from opening. Um, next slide. Now we're looking at the interior. Um, this is final paint colors, the yellow in the back and the red and the green on the sides. The corridors in the upper pictures, the main stair hallways, we'll have graphics on the wall, uh, protecting the floor because we have polished concrete in lots of places and putting the masonite down. Um, next slide. So now in the bathrooms and classroom areas, you have final wall tiles in the bathrooms and plumbing fixtures in the toilet partitions will go in classrooms. So in the upper right hand corner, you can't see it, but that's a um, storage container, um, upper cabinet, and all the teachers on their cadre tour sign the face of the door, you know, kind of like walking them into the classrooms. It's kind of a, a simple gesture, I'm sorry. All right, uh, all the next slide, yeah. So this shows the, I took a picture and stick skinned it up right in the middle. That's a roll of carpet. We've got carpet in about a third of the classrooms already. And uh, it's really exciting to uh, see that level of progress. Um, uh, we've also ordered all the furniture uh, to, to arrive for all the students that arrive first day. So that's um, on order, ready to be shipped. And as soon as we're, um, what is it called? Dust free, the IT connections, all the furniture, uh, a temporary certificate of occupancy, everything rolls into place. So, uh, exciting times. You can also see in the upper right hand corner, the gymnasium final colors, the um, windows that are in place, but we also now have the acoustical panel. So it's progressing very well. Uh, the wood floor will be arriving next. We'll see that. Um, next slide. Now you're looking, I mentioned as you walk in the front door, so the upper left hand corner, you walked in the front door and you look to the left. That's one of the two vestibules. Um, uh, there's a, a vestibule for the thermal break, and then there's a vestibule that has a security break in it. So on the upper right hand corner, the two windows are sh showing those two different windows. Uh, that's the window out of the library looking to the west, directly at Pikes Peak, and then the STEM lab. Um, progressing very well. Next slide. Um, now you're up on the stage looking at the cafeteria and the images of the kitchen area. The lower right hand corner, you're in the service line. You just came through the door, you do a U-turn and you turn to the right and then you get your tray of food and walk back out the door to the cafeteria. And then the overhead um, hood for the kitchen equipment. Next slide. Last slide for this series. It, it's is the, all the behind the house uh, components, the IT fiber lines, um, internet connections. Uh, we, we've um, got the lockdown box in. The, boilers, the water heaters, the electrical switch gear, and it's, it's all, like I said, coming together quite well. Um, having meetings, uh, signage and keying, and um, continue to meet with the planning team. Next slide. So in the case of high school grounds, next slide. We've already worked on the artificial turf at the both stadiums. This one is the District 20 Stadium, and I showed you a slide last a month on the um, press box, the in, painting the interior, so uh, cosmetic improvements. This is now pictures in the lower level, the um, 
ticket window, the bathrooms, the uh, team rooms, the um, concessions areas. Those will all get fresh coats of paint. It'll have um, replacement light fixtures for energy efficiency and new toilet fixtures and um, improvements to the uh, toilet partitions as well coming up before the summer. Next slide. So we call this um, post occupancy additional projects uh, over spring break. So next slide. We finished up a few items at um, Chinook Trail Middle School in the upper left hand corner. You can see some acoustical panels to help deaden the sound in the um, shop um, tech room down there, their wood shop. The other images uh, are the all three signs. They're hard to see, but you can see the big white sign in the front and then there's a little sign above the canopy and then the upper sign in the upper right hand corner. When we were there at the ribbon cutting event, none of those signs were in place, so it's finally complete. And then the lower right hand corner, there's some sewer connections that were in place. So uh, when we had some time, we were able to continue to work on items when students were there. Next slide. And with that, we ordered more furniture. So you've got the serpentine red and a few blue uh, standalone chairs in the lobby area. And then all the interior doors that were new uh, were wood, but all the existing doors remain because we weren't sure of the budget. So once we realized we had a little bit more budget left, we took out the older 40 uh, year old doors and replaced them all and using uh, hardware. So they have all new brand, do brand new doors throughout. Next slide. My last series of images here is at the Classical Academy. Uh, next slide, they have reached occupancy. So uh, call it temporary certificate of occupancy, certificate of occupancy, but they'll have the um, North edition complete for their use for school year next year. Uh, these are exterior images. Got the masonry wall from the north on the right, and the stucco wall on the left, and uh, all the different components of different angles. Next slide. Here's the interior hallways. The upper images, um, upper left is the athletic hallway. Um, on the right side is the athletic locker room. So they took advantage of some hallways and used that area for the bank of lockers. And uh, lower right hand corner is the band locker rooms down a different hallway. So it's all the finishes are in place and they're able to occupy. Next slide. I was on a tour with um, both Kevin Pack and uh, LeVon Coles on this uh, um, walk around tour. They were very proud of their space. So they're standing in the uh, wrestling room and in the upper right hand corner is the weight room and then there's uh, one of the two locker rooms. It's the uh, um, weight room. It's um, rubberized turf so uh, when weights drop it kind of grisses down but really what it is they, they've got the stations the white and the black or the um, I'm not a weightlifter, but the uh, <laughs> equipment it, uh, gets to rest but you can see the green stripes it's actually uh, uh, scaled after uh, a, a turf field of a, um, outdoor football. Next slide. More interior images. This series of pictures is the um, four choir areas, the ensemble rooms in the upper left, the two small ones, choir room medium on the right, and the large choir room in the lower. Um, turned out very well. Like, the acoustics are great. The students just the anxious to get in there, but the teachers really like the space. Um, next slide. Here's the band side. So the three band rooms, the large one in the lower right hand corner and two smaller band rooms in the upper right. Very bright, very well acoustically attuned spaces. Last slide, please. Or behind the house, there's two brand new um, bathrooms with showers and attached to the locker room areas. Um, their water refill station. And this is the part of the existing building where their fire suppression piper sprinkling system is in place, but they're fencing that off and uh, having a training room right next to it. So last slide, please. I hope what I shared today was concise, relevant, measurable. Uh, the bond is doing very well. And um, as I've mentioned, it's on budget, on schedule. And I do want to officially thank Katrina for her efforts. I thanked her in person last time and gave her a card, but I forgot to say it at the podium. So Tina, I welcome you to your position. And, um, with that, I open it up to any questions uh, with the ex one exception one piece. We will be meeting with the Citizens Bond Group next Wednesday, and we plan to have a tour in July. So with that, I open it up. Thank you. Questions, comments, Mrs. Conninger. Um, I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, Tom uh, Lavalley, you talk a lot about um, our schools being 
um, on budget and things like that, I would say that TCA looks a little bit better than a Toyota or a Honda. I'm just saying it is really impressive, but I also believe and have said all along that the preparation that went into their, um, you know, behind the scenes before the bond campaign and all of that was on par for having such an incredible space. That is, I mean, I've gone on several tours there and I love it. And when we were talking earlier about bond language and mill levy language and things like that, we talked about how some of that we have to talk about, you know, kind of the not so glamorous parts. I've worked with Henry for so many years that talking about wires and, and, and boiler rooms and all of that kind of stuff is a bit second nature, so I appreciate that. And I always, I actually really enjoy looking at all of those more boring pictures too, because I think that that's important is that infrastructure. So um, I just appreciate that. And I just wanted to know what day uh, or what projection we have for that opening for Encompass sites. Do we know that? Yes, it'll be complete and turned over to us in July for uh -huh. occupancy in August. Uh, but not like middle of July kind of, when can they start coming in? Middle of jaw is is the is target date for um, no hard hats. Okay. So that, that's probably the next important measurable piece. Okay. Hard hats through about the 15th of, of July. Well, it looks awesome, and I'm excited to see what it went from the beam raising to that picture right there is yeah. really impressive. So again, none construction's done a fabulous job. So anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you have any comment about the Toyota or are you just going to let that in the slide? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That wasn't a hit. That was just a comment. I, I appreciate it, Mrs. Cloninger. Anybody else have comments or questions? <laughs> Thank you, Henry, for your report this evening, as always. All right. We still have four people watching our board meeting live. Um, so we're going to move on to agenda item number 11. A. But you see, they, they can take bathroom breaks and yes, everything. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave you permission, Mr. Lindbergh. All right, 11A, third quarter budget, uh, third quarter Board of Education discretionary budget update. Mr. Lavalle. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. I'll, I'll, I think this shouldn't take more than about 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> just kidding. So uh, what you have before you, and I'll wait for it to come up. Uh, it's on the yeah, second page there. Yeah, there it is. So this is the the money that the our board has uh, discretionary money to spend. Um, just briefly, uh, board docs, we've already spent that. Uh, that's a necessary expense. Uh, the Board of Education Communications uh, closed captioning, um, uh, sign language interpreters, phone bills. That's tracking pretty close. Uh, we're going to be pretty close to 12,000 by the end of the fiscal year. That, that's what this goes through the end of June. Printing and copying and travel conference registration. Now, that, the conference registration, if you'll notice, there's an expense of $5,000. That was actually moved to this next line, which is highlighted Board of Education Employee Training and Development. I anticipate this being a temporary line. This is for online stuff for us. Our CASB conference and our NSBA conferences were both online, and so they they wanted us to, to have a separate sort of line, which is fine. So that's where that 3325 expense came from. If you'll notice, we have a $5,000 expense above travel and conference registration, and we have a credit for employee training and development of $5,075. The $75 was because Ms. Reynolds actually spoke at the CASB conference, we get a $75 refund. So thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Well, well, I'm glad I took that on. That is important. So <laughs> so we we currently have a balance of $1,750, which we will probably keep. I, I don't think we're going to be doing any more training and development um, for the rest of the year. Mileage reimbursement, again, we're going to be under this year because we're just not really doing any any uh, much driving. General supplies and miscellaneous. So um, this one, it looks like, wow, you know, we're way under budget. However, um, leave that up to Ms. Kloniger. <laughs> She's going to spend it, and, and, and I'm kidding, but wisely. Th this is this is going to be teacher appreciation, which we're going to do. We're gonna, we're really trying to do well this year. So we have money in the budget, and and we're going to to try to to really honor our teachers this year. So we've got sixteen thousand left, um, and we'll just see where that goes. But I think we're doing fine there. Um, the annual retirement banquet that most certainly will be spent. I think. Um, um, Alice, Ms. Cortez is going to be spending that 14,000 for our thing next month. 
Uh, this is the end of March. I suspect it, it it's going to go out pretty quick. Non-capital equipment, that's uh, Colonel Johnson's laptop, which he needed, uh, which we had to spend, and, and that's probably all we're going to spend. And then finally, CASB dues and membership is under because we just, they charge less because they, they weren't off offering as many uh, things because of COVID. So there you have it. That's our, our, um, our budget for the year. Are there any, uh, so far, we have one more quarter left. Is there any other question, any questions for me? Thank you. I'm seeing no heads nodding, just shaking. <laughs> we must be done. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. You always are very thorough with those, so we appreciate that. I think we made it through the meeting. We're going to debrief. Was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. Now I'm seeing nods and this meeting is adjourned.